Hello again, everybody, and welcome to a hilarious edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. Boy, we're going to have a bundle of fun today. The WWE has more stars than there are in the heavens. AEW is seeing stars after getting conked on the head by Nielsen's hammer last week. And we're going to do a deep dive on Memphis wrestling in my formative years from 40 years ago this month. Just to have a little fun. All this and more to join me. Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. He's finer than frog's hair. The great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here this morning with you. I'm having coffee with Cornette, but there's an expression you don't really hear every day or uh, ever. Finer you, than a frog's hair? Finer than frog's hair. You, ju you just told me that, which is the reason why I did it, before we went on the air. And there's another thing. It took me a while to straight. You've, you've got me giggling this morning. We're just having merriment up here. Oh, yeah. But you've never heard the expression finer than frog's hair? No. I've, I don't think anyone's ever really heard that expression what, unless no, it was in a movie I, I or something. I can't guarantee you anybody that ever knew Mama Cornette for any length of time has heard, how you doing, finer than frog's hair? Because think about this, Brian. Imagine that you've got a frog in the palm of your hand, a cute little froggy. Froggy went according, he did right, honey. That's another song Mama Cornette used to sing me when I was a baby. Mama Cornette used to sing me that song. Froggy went according, he did right, honey. Froggy went according, he did right, babe. Froggy went according, he did right. Sat on the bank and cried, 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 honey, baby mine. Hopefully she didn't sound like alfalfa like you do. But anyway... Imagine you got the little frog in your hand. Can you see any hair of in your mind's eye picture? Can you see any hair on that frog? Do you know how many dead frogs I pull out of my pool every year? I don't see hair on any of them. I mean, when you're just sitting down in, in the yard and a frog comes hopping along and you pick him up and you go, hey, froggy. And There's... you pet him on his little back and then you let him hop on off. When you were a kid, at least. I know you when might not kid. get down there in your expensive designer clothing now and get down and hop around and commune with nature in your fucking Burberry shit. I don't wear that. But well, anyway, can you see the, the hair on a frog? No, and when I was a kid in well, Long Beach, go. we didn't have frogs. We didn't have frogs on the beach, and I don't want to play with frogs or hold poisonous, frogs. You got poisonous water up there? You've killed off all the marine life. It, well, you don't have to be at least they just were outside plentiful. next to a pond or a creek or a stream or a tributary. How much time did you spend next to a pond or a creek or a tributary in your life? B out here, quite a bit. You just sat there twiddling along and hanging out with the frogs? Well, as I'm walking around the fucking yard playing with the dogs... Holding the frogs close enough that you're looking at their stick. hairs? You know, when, when I was a kid, you played with sticks and things and rocks. You played with Sometimes rocks. Sometimes you put wheels on rocks so you could roll the rocks around. What? And I had a little red wagon, and I'll, I'll thank you. I'll fix your little red wagon if you make fun of my little red wagon. But no, when you're out in the yard playing when you're a kid and you're digging a hole in the ground with a stick and putting a rock in it and then covering it up with your little red wagon, whatever the kids did. A frog comes hopping along. Hippity hop, hop, hippity hop. And you, and you play with the frog. No, I never had that. Oh, for God's sake, you fucking people up And you mean to tell me you held the frog close enough to you that you saw the hairs on it? No, that's the point of being finer than frog's hair, you Neanderthal ninny. You Northeastern nincompoop. <laughs> because there, there is no hair on a frog. It's pretty fine. It's so fine you can't see it. Hence, finer than frog's hair. Huh. It's microscopic. There's a different hair See, I usually you, you hear. Know, There's a Mama, different hair I usually hear used in this equation, but Mama Cornette wouldn't have liked you. You don't. You I don't would have liked her. I I would have liked her. Well, you don't get any of her fondest phrases. Maybe I needed to hear some of her singing instead of yours. Well, that's true. She was a little more mellifluous. Anyway, did you sing with her? Was there some harmony going on? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. How dare I ask? I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I just, I just, hey, when you go to a movie, do you talk back to the screen? Huh? No, I just listen. 
It was never sing with me. Come on, let's go. You know the words. Hey, sing it with me, everybody, nobody, and anyway. <laughs> so I had a, a couple of interesting experiences. One was positive and one was negative over the past couple of days since we have spoken. I had a wonderful time over the weekend. The Monroes came over, got a lot of work done. Uh, they, they brought Cousin Lupus, and we, we did the pressure washing of the walks and the freshening up of the gravel in the French drains and the painting of the porch furniture and cleaning out the garage and there was just activity and and productive things going on and I've determined that that's what I want to do when I retire is I am not going to be on the telephone I'm not going to be on the interwebs with you I'm not going to be out and about flittering about in public being a social butterfly I'm going to be out in the garage or out in the yard digging things and, and spreading dirt and communing with Ned and petting frogs. That's what I'm going to be doing. It was a very relaxing day for my mental and, and physical betterment. I, I encourage more people to do that. Do you currently have any frogs? And well, current, there was actually, there was, last time I looked down at the creek, I did see a frog. But he went to Corton, and I hadn't seen him since. Wait right. a minute. Hold on. There's. Oh, that's your side. Okay. There's. Harley apparently has found a frog. Who? No, she. Uh, Hank next door. You remember Hank. Hank next door is the one that comes over and shits on the sidewalk. That's your neighbor? No, the neighbor's dog. Oh. My neighbors of on that side, Hank's mother is a lady, and she shits in private. <laughs> but she's... <laughs> but Harley is barking because Harley can hear Hank barking, is what the, the situation All is. Right. Out to apparently, because apparently Hank's in the backyard again. It's okay, baby. I don't know where Swami is. I should be concerned. It's okay, baby. But nevertheless, see, that's the kind of protective uh, uh, system we got going on around here. Harley, the attack Pomeranian, alerts at all intruders, both two-legged and four-legged, here on the, on the castle property. But anyway, that was a wonderful day of productivity and lack of aggravation. And then we take a drastic turn. So have I mentioned... Here on the program, I don't know, I might have to you that I had to go get my driver's license. My driver's license was about to expire because my birthday just occurred last month and you get a 30-day window, right, which was rapidly closing on my fingers. And it used to be easy here in the state of Kentucky. There's, there was driver's licenses, bureaus or outlets or whatever they call offices all over the place in the various neighborhoods and you just go and get Mine was two miles over here in the little shopping center where they had the library, and you go in there, and you take a number, and you sit there for five minutes, and you give them your license, they take your picture, you sit there five more minutes, they laminate the fucking thing, and here you go, thank you for coming, right? And there's usually about four people in there. And that's the way it was in everybody's neighborhood. And then, since I have had it, uh, I started to say reunited, yeah, since I've been reunited with my life, since I had my life renewed, they have come out with the fucking, the smart license, the smart ID or the smart license. It's so smart. It's so smart. It's like all this other smart shit. It may be smart, but nobody else is smart enough to figure out how it works or to tell you how to work it. So now, I guess for that reason, I don't know why else they would have done this. They've suddenly made about, for the Kentucky side of Louisville, there's got to be three quarters of a million or a million people in the metropolitan area without counting southern Indiana, because obviously that's a different state, different license, whatever the fuck. They got like three places to go now to get the fucking license. And... <laughs> Everybody has been talking about how, oh, you got to wait and blah, blah, blah. And you were telling me it's, it's always been chaos up there again with you and your 
fine part of the world. It wasn't an easy procedure to begin with, but ours up here or down here was a walk in the fucking park. No, it's always been a pain in the ass in New York on Long Island. Oh my God, it was an awful experience. And then here in New Jersey, it's no better. They turned me away the last time I went. I said, I need to renew my license. They said, do it online. I'm like, no, no, no. I moved. I have a new address. I want to get my address. They said, no, it's okay. Just change it online. Even though that has the wrong one, they'll scan it. They'll see the right one. I said, really? That doesn't sound right. That's what we do now. We're too busy. And oh, yeah. Away. Well, cop, cop pulls you over. Oh, yeah. Well, I see. I used to live here, but I, I live another place now. But they told me, yeah, you're going downtown. But no, it, it was a simple procedure. Again, something simple until they make it smart. So now people have been screaming, the lines are long and blah, blah, blah. So I've been attempting in between our recording schedule and my trips downtown to visit my cousin Larry to do this and a couple did it hadn't worked out. So I said, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up Monday morning. It sounds like the episode of Seinfeld where his Nana was overdrawn and, and <laughs> went downtown at six o'clock in the morning trying to find the bank over a $20 check or whatever. I'm going to get up first thing in Monday morning. They open at eight o'clock. I'll be there. At a quarter to fucking eight, standing there right in front of this place, and certainly nobody's going to make that level of commitment on a random fucking day, right? And, of course, Monday morning happens to be one of the, the chilliest day that we had had since last May, and it was drizzling. And, but I'm, I'm, it's only five miles away, and it's on the way downtown to visit Larry, so okay. I'll leave from there and I'll get back earlier. And as I'm going over there, down off of Hurstburn, which is one of the busier streets in town, but it's over on the side, and I'm going down these side streets here, and I think, well, there's there's not a soul. There's no human. I don't see an active human, a car. I'm going to have this thing licked. And I pull into place, and there's already 15 people standing out on a sidewalk shivering in the cold just that's the only place there's any sign of life is this fucking and so now i'm pissed right <clears throat> it's how about newman so i get out and i go up to get in line and there's this kindly old gray-haired lady in in front of me there she's the end of the line so i said this is the line for the driver's license right yeah do you she said do you have an appointment and no that said on the internet that they would take appointments, right? So I try to call them to make an appointment. And I get the recording. It says, we can't answer your call right now. Our business hours are such, and it's during business hours. So since we can't answer your call, we're going to forward you to Frankfurt. And they forwarded me to Frankfurt. Where in Frankfurt, their voicemail answered and said they couldn't take my call right now. But if I left a message, they'd get back to me. Why do I want somebody in Frankfurt to get back to me about a goddamn appointment at a driver's license location five miles from my house in Louisville? But if anything goes wrong with a government agency in the state of Kentucky and they don't know what to do, they send you to Frankfurt. So I said, no, ma'am, I don't have an appointment. She said, well, I don't either. Because I, I got online. I said, well, I tried to call. She said, oh, they won't answer. You've got to do it online. I said, well, I try not to do anything online. And she said, well, I tried to do it online. And they were taking appointments now for November or something, a month away. She said, I couldn't wait. So I came over here. And then this other kindly gray-haired lady come up behind me and heard what we were talking about. And said, well, I went to Bowman Field. This is my third try. I'm, I came out here. Bowman Field is the secondary airport here in town, but that's where the main driver's license place is now. And she said, I went over there, and there was 500 people there. And I just couldn't wait. So, by the way, she's, as we come to be chatting, she's in her 70s. And the other lady was in her late 60s. And we were the only people in the fucking line 
that were actually speaking to each other and not standing there in the rain staring at their fucking phone. Imagine that. So then finally, we, we established that this was complete idiocy, that they've changed this all around because it used to be so easy, and none of us want the smart fucking ID. We just want to be able to drive legally. And so finally they opened the door and they let us in, and here's the other rib. After they let a certain amount of people in, they closed the door again. And even though it's during business hours, they're making people stand in line and wait outside the door in the goddamn rain and the cold. I think that's a case for fucking Stephen P. New. But anyway, we get in there, and then they have us go all the way down a hall so that we can turn around and come back down the hall that we just fucking went down the other direction so that we can be in the proper order to line up in front of the desk. It looked like if they'd been playing music and handed us some fucking chairs, we could have had a goddamn party. We're just walking around in fucking circles. Then the daggum, the people working there, I can't, and the ladies next to me, because we were sticking together at this point, couldn't understand a goddamn bit of the instructions they were trying to give us because everybody working there had the thickest accent I've ever heard. And I don't think they were the same accents. I'm not trying to be insensitive to people of other cultures. But there was people from, I don't know where they were from in the world, speaking to all of us about trying to tell us where to fucking go and we couldn't understand a goddamn word. And I don't think they could understand each other because as I mentioned, they were different accents. And then my hearing is not the best and one of the women next to me is almost deaf. So we're trying to interpret for each other. Oh, get in that line. Oh, we're going to section D. And, and cubicle number 10. Oh, thank you. So I went up finally and told him, I want the minimum, cheapest, easiest, quickest driver's license that will enable me to drive legally without being ticketed and identify myself if necessary to law enforcement. I'm not going to leave the country, nor am I going to get on a plane, nor am I going to, I believe you also have to have one of these smart, if you want to go to the Capitol or something, or the state governor's mansion or whatever the fuck, as I'm not going to visit any of those places. Just let me drive. And then I go in there, give them the old license, take a picture, tell them the same information, blah, blah, blah. And normally, as I mentioned before, they would give you your license, right? She gives me a piece of paper and says, well, we'll mail it to you in about two or three weeks. Don't throw it out. It might look like junk mail. What the? F so this, is the, now this has been a whole procedure to get it in three weeks rather than just hand it to me. What happened to their laminating machine? I don't even know if my picture turned out properly. At least you got in the door. I got turned away. Well, they took one look at you. What the hell does that mean? What do you think it means? I'm a good-looking man. I don't know what that means. Well, that means then they were, they were scared you'd come in and take all the women. Or potentially all the men. Or you'd be like the Pied Piper. They'd all follow, follow you out. That would happen. Well, that's what happened to me. It's a pain in the ass. I mean... And like you said, they mail it unmarked. I once had an issue with my registration where I renewed it. They sent it to me. They said they sent it to me. I never got it. And I'm like, what the hell? And then I had to have them send it to me again. And I didn't get it. They sent it. It looks like spam mail. So I didn't even open it. And then eventually, so you were throwing it away every time they'd send it to you. No, I had a pile of it here to go through. <laughs> and then I went through it and I had two different registrations. <laughs> but wait a minute. So you keep your spam mail... To go through at a well, no. much later date. When I say spam mail, I shouldn't say spam mail. Mail that looks like I'm going to open Your it. Your junk mail. I'm going to open it, give it a quick once over, see what it is, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> and then it goes in a shredder. So that's what you keep for extended periods of time. Is just mail that may be on the fence. 
not extended periods of time. I think this was right around the time I moved to the new address, which is what necessitated How the new registration. How long did it take them to, to send you to fucking registrations? I don't know. See, that's the other problem. I don't know exactly when they arrived because it was just like, what's this shit? Well, yeah, because for an extended yeah. period of time, your shit was sitting over the corner unattended because you were being lackadaisical about your personal business. Because I got pulled over one time. Well, and that and that led you down a life of crime? How is that an excuse? It for... always works out nice. I'm a very nice guy. Uh, and if the cop's a Met fan, I'm good. So <laughs> I get pulled over, and the officer said, you were going a little fast. I said, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get home. And he said, can I see your license, registration, and insurance? Yeah, because that was such a novel excuse. And I said, here's my license. The address on there is not the accurate address, because they said you can scan it. <laughs> I don't have my current registration because I can't get them to mail it to my house. I don't know what's going on. And I can't get someone on the phone there. And the website sucks because it's a government website. Here's my old registration for this car. And then for the insurance. I, and here's two free passes to the strip club. And I said, here's my insurance card from last, uh, from six months ago. It's the same policy number. I just didn't put the new card in here. And he said, don't worry, I can get the registration off the windshield. What the I'll be right fuck? back. And he went into oh. his car, and he looked, and he saw a perfectly clean record because I am an upstanding <laughs> citizen. And he came back, and he handed me my stuff. He said, go slower next time. And I said, of go course. Slow. Go in peace. And I said, go. thank you very much. And Can I give you an escort back home? You've been so kind, citizen. And you're using your left and right turn indicators in your car. Only get an escort when you need it. Don't call that card in until you need it. That's what I've learned. Oh, good Lord. Uh, anyway, how do you follow that? With You know, you ought to be in prison. Who? You, if, if it had been anybody else, it would, prison? It would immediately been, you would have been tased, bro. And drug downtown. Now listen, if this had happened in Queens, yeah, I probably would have gotten arrested. <laughs> but it happened here in the wonders of suburbia where we're not committing crimes. We're, we're not... the polo ponies roam free. Well, there are a lot of horses uh, nearby, yes. That used to be the fucking thing we would do about Heyman. Paul, because Paul E's from Scarsdale, New York, right? He, I don't know if he still maintains a residence there, but he grew up there and lived there for much of his adult life through the ECW years, especially. And we would always describe it, Paulie's from Scarsdale, where the polo ponies roam free. Scarsdale's overrated. It's not that nice. They had a good diet there. Okay. Wasn't there a was the, the Scarsdale diet? I don't, is this a Heyman joke? I don't know what you're no, doing. No, no, it was the Scarsdale diet. <laughs> It was a big Hopefully he wasn't on the Scarsdale diet. It's a well, horrible no, endorsement. Well, actually, well, here's the thing. He may have been. He may have been because the guy that wrote the the book that was a big hit in the 80s or whatever ended up, didn't he murder his wife? I don't know. That has nothing so, to do with Heyman. I don't know what. Well, maybe you never know. Maybe Paul's eating out of guilt. Is that true? I don't know anything about the Scarsdale well, diet. Well, look, look up Scarsdale diet murder. We got, Hey, the wrestling ain't going to be fucking as interesting as this, folks. While he's looking that up, I'm going to remind you that the holiday sale has started at JimCornette.com and everything, the, everything we got is right out there on display for you to purchase peruse and pick through fill your holiday season with joy for your friends and your family and their stockings and their panties crotchless panties you can stick some of these things in those and uh, remember the iconic cornet face t-shirt is on display and sale as well as the midnight express 40th anniversary four pack action figure set which you cannot do without and there's only about 700 and something chances in the world now for you to get those because the others have been spoken for. All the information at jimcornet.com and so much more. And have you found the Scarsdale mystery by that uh, by this time, Brian? The Scarsdale diet, a high protein, low carbohydrate fad diet designed for weight loss, created in the 70s by Herman Tarnauer. Tarnauer, that was him. And named for the town in New York where he practiced cardiology. Uh, he wrote a book. See, he probably worked on a member of the Heyman family. He was born March 18th, 1910. He died March 10th, 1980. He was an American cardiologist and co-author. 
of the best-selling diet book, The Complete Scarsdale Medical Diet, in 1978, which promoted, once again, a high-protein, low-carbohydrate fad diet, known as the Scarsdale Diet, on March 10th, 1980, just eight days before his 70th birthday, he was shot dead by Gene Harris. That's right. He didn't murder his wife. His wife murdered him or his girlfriend or his paramour or spurned suitor. What uh, was she? Well, she was convicted of murder at a trial in White Plains. That was another big event in White Plains, New York, ladies and gentlemen, in 1981. And she was the headmistress of the Madeira School for Girls in McLean, Virginia. What was her connection to this guy? Well, that's what I'd, I can't remember, and I'd like to know. Is it listed? Uh, she met ta uh, Tarnower. She was the, the mistress of Head? She met him in 1966, the year after her divorce, and then they began a 14-year relationship. Well, there you go. He showered her with gifts and exotic vacations, but he had relationships with other women during these years. Like he showered author. her like any with good gifts author. and... He showered her with gifts, and she showered him with lead. All right, well, and she's dead now. She died in 2012, New Haven, Connecticut, in jail. Well, in jail? Or, uh, <laughs> did she get out? I'm trying to see. Did she get out? I don't know. Wikipedia is not just, just say when she went in and when she got out, if anything. Hey, that's all we're asking, Wikipedia. Just tell us when these people went to jail and got out. Is that too much to oh, ask? No. She was in an assisted living center. Well, was it well, for the criminally insane or, or was just no other uh, information list. Do you get to, do you get to move from prison to assisted living? Is that how that works? Huh. In the 1997 Seinfeld episode, the summer of George Raquel Welch plays herself portraying Harris in a fictional Tony award winning musical yes. about the murders called Scarsdale surprise. There you go. Oh, you know what? See? I didn't even put two and two together. That was the reference. Wow. There you go. <laughs> you didn't see all stick with me, kid. You didn't say anything either. You didn't remember that either. I've, I've remembered enough to, to get you to look it up. <laughs> The Scarsdale Surprise. So, see, stick with me, kid, and you'll be farting through silk. That's what, uh, uh, I, I got an email real quick from, from one of the readers, or from one of the readers. I'm going to read an email from one of the listeners. That's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, we got from Scott from Dundee, Scotland. Kind of, that's funny how they Scott from Scotland. And it's from Dundee, Scotland, where Bill Dundee got his name from because in Australia, he was from Scotland. So that's as clear as mud. Um, and Scott's been having health problems and job problems, but he's feeling better physically. We hope that everything improves for him. Good luck, Scott. Rah, rah. But he, he had the, and it was, it's a cute question. And tell me if I should go into any detail. Because we've done this so much, but now I've realized that since I'm so incredibly old and i've been a celebrity for so incredibly long that some of the young people have not heard this story so i figured we'd at least reference it because scott wrote a nice email he says i was born in 1987 so my first interaction of seeing jim was on the original raw is war when he did the phone-ins <laughs> where he i think he's talking about the stand-up you know uh, uh, blue screen background promos where he did these amazing rants and was slating people for fun. For those of you in the States, that's uh, knocking people. I like the idea that you would phone those in. <laughs> it would, yeah, we got Jim I, Cornell on our phone. What, do you, what does he want to say? Oh, wow. <laughs> if I'd have had the option, boy, um, I just want to know who actually came up with this idea. Was it a Vincent K. McMahon idea, or was it a rib on yourself? As much as people love it nowadays, the rants and ripping people a new one, just seems like a bit of a waste. <laughs> yeah, and you know, this is one of those topics that every few years we hit on, but we still get a ton of questions, especially from younger listeners or new listeners or, you know, people that are just discovering this stuff, wanting to know what the story behind it was. Well, and they won't go away because of the, you know, the Twitter machine and the, you know, YouTube and et cetera, et cetera. And the, and the cock, our friends over at the cock network. But basically, the story real quickly for Scott from Scotland and anybody who might be of his uh, youth or inexperience, this was during the Attitude Era. I was working 
as a producer, and that's in the office in Stanford, but on television as a producer primarily, was not an on-air character. And then was that's when we told the stories. I was doing third-party bookings for the talent and working in the other various aspects, but I hadn't been on TV. And suddenly I pop up just cutting these promos on everybody, not only knocking WCW, who our opposition was, or just recently because it was the anniversary of Brian Pillman's death. A lot of the people on Twitter were passing the one around where I ripped Phil Mushnick, who apparently is still a miserable fucking human being. And why? Why did this suddenly come up? And the story was basically that Kevin Kelly was hosting the, I guess, the first version of Bite This, B-Y-T-E, see, that's, you know, marketing, on WWF.com when there were no uh, really podcasts or audio shows on the internet or, well, you probably know more about the time period and what was available and what was not, but there weren't a lot of people listening to that type of thing at this point in time, were there? There weren't that many really audio shows out there talking about wrestling. There were some local radio shows. WW, radio WWF was done by that point. They gave up on that. But th but that was actual radio shows. Right, and this is the yeah. beginning of like the internet, of the internet wrestling community. So this was one of the first attempts to try to get some of that kind of attention. Right, so... <laughs> Kevin, because, you know, uh, that was low priority also, like at TV, it's not like, oh, we've got to record audio of one of the stars for Bite This when we're doing fucking USA Network and it's the Attitude Era and there's 10 million people watching whatever. So Kevin's trying to get people to do it on the phone and shit. He said, hey, you want to do Bite This? I said, what is Bite This? And he told me. And he said... I said, well, what, who are we talking to here? And what are we talking about? He said, we can talk about anything we want because nobody listens to this. Not even, nobody really out there in the scheme of things. I mean, I don't know if it was thousands of people, probably not tens of thousands at that point. Um, he said, nobody listens, and nobody listens to it in the office. He said, let's just, just let's do a phone call and just have fun. He said, I want to ask you about, that's when they had the first one, they had done the parody of the four horsemen on Nitro when Nash and Hall dressed up as a drunk Arn Anderson and a decrepit Ric Flair and whatever the fuck. And this was not that long after the curtain call and the headaches that I had personally been suffered through because of the goddamn problems with Hall and Nash and all the fucking click and blah, blah, blah on the creative team having to put up with this horse shit. I was like, okay, I'll talk about that. So I cut a fucking promo on it, basically. Say, Here's what I think. And, they, and then that was the end of that. It was on the phone from my house. And then the next day, Vince calls me. Maybe it was two days later. I don't know. But if Vince actually called, say, pal, I heard you were on Bite This. I'm like, oh, my. first thing I'm thinking is, Kevin Kelly, you motherfucker. You told me nobody listens to this shit, right? I said, yeah. He said, would you like to, in some fashion, he asked me, would I like to do what I did on Bite This on Raw? And I said, what? I, again? And he said they got more feedback from that appearance that I did on Bite This for Bite This than all the other Bite Thises that they had ever done to begin with. Because obviously, the this was an early version of Smart Fan Radio, right? And we just thought we were talking to nobody. So I said, uh, okay, you want me to? Yeah, he's, and that's what he said. Just make sure you run it by Jerry McDivitt so that we don't... And, and on several of those, the Mushnick and whatever the fuck, I would run it by Jerry McDivitt so that we couldn't get sued for libel or slander or any, you know, related incidents when I'm talking about WCW and the people. And otherwise, I can fucking lay into anybody I want to. And... The problem was, as I told him, 
I said, I can't just slander WCW for, in some cases, doing some of the same things we're doing. So I got to knock this company, too. And it's that way it's balanced. But I'll knock the WWF for petty crimes and really, you know, lay into WCW for the heavy shit. Okay. Well, nobody else liked me knocking the company nor understood why in the company. The fans loved it. But people in the company are like, why is he doing this? The fans loved it. They still love it. Yeah. And, but at the same time, I am like, why am I doing it? You can't just do that fucking weekly. It had, and it had to go somewhere, but it didn't go anywhere because it was just him giving me three minutes to get myself over. But then, and that's, as I've mentioned before, that's the only time I ever wrote a promo down because, you know, I do get wound up sometimes. And I had to fucking stick to what I had told McDivitt, so I wrote it down and they put it on the teleprompter. But they only gave me the set three minutes or whatever it was. So I had to have them turn that teleprompter really fast. That's why it's fucking nonstop, right? Because I want to get this shit in. That's the only time I've read a promo, but I feel like I'm not cheating because I wrote it to begin with. And it was legal parameters but nevertheless after a while and i because i don't think i don't know what kevin dunn liked it not content wise but just because it was me and people were reacting to it and i know that russo didn't like it because every time i would talk about wrestling fans want to see wrestlers and wrestling matches and things of that nature when they'd show it on the screen in the arena I was supposed to be the out-of-touch asshole, but the fans were cheering it. And so he didn't like that. So then at, at one point they started to, well, maybe you could do something funny on something, or maybe you could, and then they start telling me what, I'm like, nah. And I would just, you know, you got any ideas, Corey? No, nah, really nothing too much. And I just kind of, they never canceled it. I never offered to do more. And... We just quit doing it. But it was bizarre, but that was another thing Vince wanted people to talk about the TV show. That would have that would have been great. That segment continuing like for another year and a half, two years, just that was the only thing you did on the show. Here's Jim Cornette, and you can say whatever you want. Yeah, but the thing is, as I was getting grumpier, I probably would have started going after the WWF a little sharper. And uh that probably wouldn't have got me any fucking friends and acquaintances uh you know moving forward with that so I, but yeah it it accomplished nothing except to give me a chance to go out there and fucking vent at people but it was never meant it was never the start of something and it was never thought out and obviously shit stain's gonna put no thought into putting it on the program is only when vince wanted me to fucking blister somebody but he came to the right place. What if Tony Khan said, Jim, I'll give you three minutes on my show every week. You could say whatever you want about anybody and you can record it anywhere you want. <laughs> anybody. No, I'd be, I'd be like Thunderbolt Patterson. If I only <laughs> had time, I'd need more than three minutes. Give me the first 30 minutes. And it, as a matter of fact, by the, by the end of the first 30 minutes, he'd either have the highest rated program ever or nobody'd be watching anymore. How about he gives you picture in picture? You could do whatever you want. You could hold up whatever you want during picture in picture. <laughs> Only if Tony Storm's on the couch with me. Only if it's silent. If, well, yeah, it, it better be silent. And possibly in the dark also as well. Yeah, can I cover my eyes? But anyway, can we move on to the next segment? Because we have a return, ladies and gentlemen, to one of the more popular segments. We've, we've uh, not had it again for the past couple of weeks because of breaking news. But since all the news that's broken is broken this week, we're going to bring back, ladies and gentlemen, one of our popular recurring segments, talking about Reggie's Corner. <laughs> Reggie's Corner. We're here to talk about your good boys and girls. Reggie's Corner. We're so sorry they're dead now. Oh, me. There it is. It's still there. 
anyway, um, not going to go into a ton of detail but again this week because we want to recognize a number of people and don't want to bring everyone down, but our good boys and girls uh, deserve recognition no matter what species they may belong to. And I tell you the first one, Eric from Hamilton, Ontario, and you know who you are, but if not, you lost your 16-year-old cat Special Agent Jack Bauer. And Eric wrote an email, and I can't, I can't read it or else wise, I won't be in the mood to do the rest of the show. Uh, very sad. His wife and son, uh, he all loved Special Agent Jack Bauer. And he was 16 years old, almost 17, and half Persian, half Tabby. So, again, Eric, we, we're sorry for your loss there, but you Dad gummit, I'm gonna snurfle if I read any more of that. Rich, where are you from, Rich? You didn't say. But you lost your cat Bootsies, also at 16 years old, one of the most affectionate cats he had ever known. Usually fallen asleep right above his wife's head. So Rich had had a wife with a pussy on her head every night, and now Bootsy's gone. And we, we're going to miss Bootsy. Um, Dominic I wrote, Today I had to let my best friend Sassy, uh, a.k.a. Sassafras, cross the Rainbow Bridge after a short bl battle with cancer. She was a half-blind tabby cat, but never acted as if it was an issue. She would lay in the most unnecessary spots and plant all of her weight if I tried moving her. Her favorite spot was in front of my heater, which she headbutted so much that it had dents in it. Okay. <sighs> Sounds like a healthy relationship. Sassy loved listening to the shows and hearing Jim lose his mind at AEW. Clearly, she was banging her head out. Clearly, <laughs> that's... <laughs> he says a place in Reggie's corner would mean the world to me. By the way, does Colin Thompson owe you money? <laughs> um, Very good. Very good. But was she banging her head into the heater till it was dented while she was listening to our programs? I'm hoping not. We're very big with the headbangers. Well, Dominic, we're sorry about Sassafras, but you might ought to have looked into a kitty psychiatrist. Anyway, uh, Zeb from Kannapolis, North Carolina, his 15-year-old dog, Lundy, passed away and he said about her she will be greatly missed by everyone in the house especially the kids who have known her their entire lives and you know that's so when you think about it if you time the kids and the dog or the cat or whatever the pet at the same time kids are probably going to outlast the pet and then they've known little lundy or wh whoever for all their lives that's sad yeah it is <sighs> Well, Chris from Livingston, New Jersey. Hey, that's right over here. Right over there. You're yeah. over there now? They used to have an okay deli there, and then they closed during the pandemic. Well, here's something else they're known for. Apparently, Chris says he lost his dog, Mickey, who passed away from cancer. But it's, you know, he says it's hard to watch wrestling now because he was a huge Cody and Punk and Sami Zayn mark. Uh, he got excited over their music and would and would bark, but nevertheless, he uh, we're sorry about Mickey Chris, but he says also P.S. I know Q.T. Marshall is from Livingston, New Jersey. Please don't hold it against us. Oh no, shit! I didn't. I knew he was from New Jersey. I didn't know it was Livingston. Wow, that's interesting. It makes me see him very differently. Or maybe he was working in that deli. No, I don't think he was. That's, that, deli, that's that deli was bullshit. You know what the biggest bullshit thing is? You wouldn't know anything about this. In New York... Well, then why are you... You know what the biggest bullshit thing is? You wouldn't know anything about this. You asked, answered your own question. In New York, we have actual kosher delis. And you get whatever it is, whatever the rabbi's blessing, those hot dogs and that pastrami taste better than everywhere else. It's great shit. And then there are some delis that are not kosher, but they've figured it out. Katz's isn't kosher but they figured it out. Carnegie, when it was open, had their thing going on. They figured it out. Then there's this bullshit trend now of New York-style deli. 
which is basically a kosher deli without any Jews attached. <laughs> and they had this deli over there. I shouldn't say that because I don't know who owned it, but New York style is not kosher. And it was just bland. It was like you wanted to really like it. And I had it fresh and it wasn't very good. It See, was okay. You can, but you, okay, now I really don't. So what are you saying to me here? Are you saying that they prepare the actual meat or toppings or materials of the food the same way, but it tastes different if the rabbi doesn't bless it? Well, I guess there's something in the actual preparation that must. Oh, yes, yeah, th you think there might also be something else different as about well that as the also, way it's as prepared. opposed to just hoodoo to voodoo, or and then suddenly as changes well as the, the way molecular composition. As well as the way the amount of people that don't know how to make a good hot dog that sell hot dogs is astounding in the tri -state. Well, how is the sausage made, Brian? I'm not going to tell you that. Why should I tell you that? You have a horrible diet. You eat the worst things. I know, but you I show don't no that. desire to convert yourself to a better way of eating. Hold on now. Hold hold the phone. Just hold on to the line to pump the brakes. Squeeze them. I have not only converted my diet from all junk to just majority 40 junk, junk. <laughs> but also much less of the junk. And now currently weigh... I believe I've mentioned around 187, 188 pounds. You know what? If you were on Facebook, there was a video I was going to send you the other day, but you're not there, so I didn't send you anything, and well, I'll just tell you another about another case of there you are. No, they have these shorts. It's like you click on this feed, and you get like these vertically filmed videos, like one after another. Typically, they're short. There goes the name shorts. And they had one of these two guys in India, I think, and they're great because they always make this food, and you see the whole process, and they just yell the ingredients at you. Like, sugar, salt, <laughs> like one after another, then they use it. But they were frying chicken using Sprite. And I'd never seen that before. And I thought of you because you're Captain Sprite. Well, you know, you also, you can prepare barbecued ribs to go on the grill by baking them in Coca-Cola or Sprite. If you don't want any caffeine or whatever, the carbonation and the, et, et cetera, adds to the, uh, and the sugar, I guess, and et cetera, adds to the overall scheme of things. Have you ever had Sprite fried chicken? I have never, I've never heard of the Sprite fried chicken. And I'm actually, I'm questioning now how the fuck that we've come around in the middle of Reggie's Corner to a... To talk about to eating a animals. of eating... <laughs> how to prepare and eat. <laughs> you fucking sick fuck. Oh. What her, what is the matter with you? But besides that, going back to the rabbi. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, yes, there's got to be some difference in the preparation also of this. It's just it, you're talking about a good deli or a bad deli. If it's good food or bad food. Now, if you have to, if you want to be the kosher person, then you should go to the kosher place. But if not. But the kosher place, has, that's the thing. There is not a kosher deli that does not have better deli food than the New York style delis. Well, I'm not disagreeing with you there. There, there was a when I went to Atlanta in the summer. Lido of Kosher in Long Beach, Lido Kosher Deli. I I tier. used to eat lunch every day, and I would think of New York because in, in right we lived at the Falcons Rest, that uh, converted fucking roadside motel that we roomed in while we were there, and right on the corner in Hapeville, Georgia, at right outside the airport was the New York sandwich shop. And I would go there every day for my lunch before we went to the town and get a New York cheesesteak. New York cheesesteak? It was, <laughs> I'm telling you, because <laughs> it's the sign said New York sandwich shop, so that's the way they make sandwiches in New York, right? Even though the guy was, I don't know if he was Korean or Vietnamese or but somewhere in that neck of the woods in the world, and I don't know if he'd ever been to New York, but a New York steak and cheese sandwich was the steak meat on a goddamn white hoagie bun with goddamn lettuce, tomato, mayonnaise, and I think it was some kind of Swiss cheese. And that's obviously the way they do it in New York, right? What ended up being your favorite place in New York? Was it Carnegie? Did you ever get down to Katz's? I know you didn't go to Second Avenue, which is the best of the I did, bunch. We didn't, we didn't get to Katz's, but I loved Carnegie Deli because that's the only place that I could go after a Ring of Honor show where I hadn't eaten for 24 hours and 
and leave full. I would tear that fucking place up. <laughs> 24 hours of sandwich they delivered to you. And that's how big those sandwiches were. Oh, I'm no, that's the thing is I would train from the from dinner the night before if I knew the Ring of Honor show with the Hammerstein. Hammerstein, Hammerstein. Did we ever settle that argument? Even I don't know, no. Um Hammerstein, I, I, I believe. Okay, if it was a Saturday, I would eat dinner on the Friday night, and Saturday I'd be over there early, and I'd be in training anyway for Carnegie, and I'd go through all of the aggravation and heartache and frustration of the wrestling show. And then we would get over there to the Carnegie Deli and buy cracky. They say if if you didn't if you don't leave with some, we made it wrong. They made several of my sandwiches wrong because I ate the whole fucking thing. There's like what two pounds of yeah of of uh what's on the Reuben the corned beef's what I'm trying to say. I used to eat their pastrami. You couldn't even call it a sandwich because it would be like two thin slices of rye, but two pounds of meat on top of yes. it. Yes. So and the, the burger was a one pound burger, which I finished and part of a sandwich on one memorable occasion. But it was like, and the bun was giant. It was like the size of a 45 RPM record, the whole thing. I'm, I don't mean thickness, I mean circular. And everything, it was all 20. This was what, 15 years ago? It was all 20 and $25 for a sandwich or whatever. But a normal person could eat on it for three or four fucking days. You said something interesting, and then we can get back to Reggie's corner. Oh, I forgot. We're eating animals again. To get away from that, just the overall idea of eating, you are an expert in eating. In terms of training yourself, if you know you have a big meal coming the next day, what should the average person's preparation be the day before? Well, speaking from experience, just don't eat. Don't eat. Don't eat that day. That way you can tear everything because the anticip anticipation, anticipation, it's making me wait. Boom, 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 boom. It's keeping me wait. Yay, 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 yay. Oh, God, come on. I know you hate that so bad. That's why I do it. Uh, no, cause it, I mean, normally at the, that's the thing is part of it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because I was at these fucking shows. Sometimes you get to the building at noon, if it's a TV production or whatever. And by the time you get out of there, it's fucking midnight. And I didn't, I don't like to eat a big breakfast and then go to a show because now I'm lazy and lethargic. So I'm always on edge at a show to begin with. Cause I'm high. And then finally, when I get out, that's my reward. Binge eating. That's why it's unhealthy for me to be around the fucking wrestling business. But anyway, back to the corner. We're over here now. Uh, Tony and Melissa. Don't know where you're from either, but uh, you'll recognize yourselves because they lost their 12-year-old boxer lab mix, Rupert. Poor Rupert, but uh, I especially wanted to recognize this because Rupert's sister's name was Harley Quinn. And she misses him also. And they they wrote, a, again, a, a touching email, but I don't want to get into the medical diagnosis just to bring everybody down from being hungry after we talked about the Carnegie Deli. Uh, Gabriel and his family, I won't mention their last name, Gabe, you know why. Uh, they lost their cat, Orion. Because he used to book Ring of Honor? No, not that one. Uh, but they lost their cat, Orion, 15 years old. And he was obviously a big part of their family. And they played the song saying goodbye from the Muppets take Manhattan at his funeral. Oh, that really is fucking sad. Oh my God. That's, you know that song? That's a sad song. I've not seen the flick. If you're a kid and you love the Muppets, that's every one of the Muppets leaving the other ones sadly and slowly including like on a train waving goodbye and on a bicycle waving goodbye. <laughs> and everyone leaves Kermit all alone to try to struggle in 1980s Manhattan. And then along comes a goddamn bus or a taxi or something and squashes the frog in the middle of the gutter at yeah. the end. No, it's serious. Well, not the end, but that is what happens. He gets hit what? by a Kermit gets hit by a car what? and he gets amnesia and he doesn't know who he is. And the other Muppets find out that Kermit's play is going to get greenlit it's going to be on broadway but kermit's missing and he doesn't know who he is so all the other muppets have to reconvene 
come back to the diner in which all their dreams came to fruition, team up with the rats that work in the diner and the other humans that are there that seem to be accepting of these Muppets. And they have to find Kermit before the Broadway play. Kermit, meanwhile, gets out of the hospital and gets a job as an ad executive on Madison Avenue, <laughs> forgetting anything about his past. And uh, he ends up working as an advertising executive until he bumps into the other Muppets in the diner the day of the opening of the play, and they drag him there, and Miss Piggy punches him in the head, and that triggers him to remember who he is and all the songs, and then they get married. I don't know which is more disappointing to me as a member of the human race, the fact that somebody got paid to write that movie or that you just gave that detailed blow-by-blow -blow description. It's a good movie. You have to, I can't believe you don't appreciate the Muppets. You were a teenager in the late seventies. They were all over what? TV and they were wild. You got a teenager appreciating the Muppets? Yes. The Muppet show was not for little kids. It just so happens that little kids liked it. I, I, I was, I was making towns and most of the fucking nights. The Muppet show was on the air. The Muppets take Manhattan's good. You should watch it. You need to review that the King of Kong and the Muppets take Manhattan. Let me tell you, and at that period of time, if, if it was going to be a movie with a lot of people in it and the back row was going to be empty, I did not see movies like that on dates at that time period of my life. I went to the less popular flicks that were going to be mostly empty. You know, the other interesting thing, too, is the first Muppet movie is the Muppet movie. The second one's the great Muppet caper, where they're in England and there's a jewel theft and they have to solve everything with Charles Grodin as the villain. Then it's the Muppets take Manhattan. And that phrase got to be such a thing that when Friday the 13th ran out of ideas, it was Jason takes Manhattan. And that was when Jason came to New York and started killing people in Midtown. And now you've established that you know the chronology of all of the Muppets movies. Oh, I know all their stuff. I think they're brilliant. Yeah. Frank Oz, so Jim Henson, secretly, Richard secretly, Hunt. Secretly, when you were a child, you wanted to stick your hand up Miss Piggy's ass. No, no, she didn't really do it for me. Kermit? I didn't want to stick my hand up his ass. I wanted oh, to kind of... Oh, 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 never mind. I'm, I'm trying. I'm getting too personal. with obviously something that's a touchy... Well, we're back on frogs, and we're back in Reggie's up. corner. <laughs> There's been a frog... A frog turnaround here. Rolando. <laughs> Rolando from Pennsylvania. Conan. Conan! Rolando from Pennsylvania wrote, We owned four dogs until this past weekend when one of our beloved pets passed away. This particular dog was my son's favorite, and after a day of grieving, my son asked me if I would submit our dog's story to Reggie's Corner. Our dog's name was Henry Wigglebottom III. On account of he had a little nub for a tail, and every time he wanted to wiggle it, he would wiggle his entire backside. When Henry came to us, I knew that we were not going to let him go because he looked exactly like my first wife. No, I'm sorry. Scratch that. <laughs> like my, no, like my wife's first dog, Mo. <laughs> sorry, that's, that's, an important, <laughs> that's an important distinction we need to... Looks like my first wife, we Mo. We need to make his first wife's no wife's first dog i'm sorry his, it looked like his wife's first dog mo who had passed away just months before henry wigglebottom the third arrived at our house so we wanted to recognize rolando we're sorry for your guys loss and and your wife mo reen sorry for what your first wife apparently looked like i don't know is this the last one? I hope, my God. Is this his last wife? Is no, that what you were going to say? <laughs> is this the last thing, man? Hold on, there's two more. Okay. Dear Jim and Brian, this is from Stacy from Stratford, Ontario, on behalf of Chuck and Laura. Okay. Dear Jim and Brian, my WWE boyfriend, parenthetically, we only watch pay-per-views together, and his wife recently lost their English bulldog, Mr. Bean. Mr. Uh, Mr. Bean was 11, almost 12, when he crossed the Rainbow Bridge. Bean was always super excited when I would come over for the WWE pay-per-views, barking at me, following me, his little butt just wiggling. Bean was our chaperone to make sure nothing happened. So date night, as we call it, surely isn't the same without him. 
actually this it, is uh, an interesting story well yeah and actually so it won't be the same because without mr bean there cock blocking your wwe uh, boyfriend yeah the wwe boyfriend is that apparently the only reason because here's the statement bean was our chaperone to make sure nothing happens so without bean she says so it's date a license night, to as fuck. we call it surely isn't the same without it's not gonna be i think the wwe programs are gonna start getting a lot more exciting yeah without bean it's a license to fuck well hey now that's they say this is Stratford, Ontario. Yeah. You know, th things are void in Ontario. Is this so a, it's, is, it's, is this I think a Canadian you have to rule? say fornicate. Is this a Canadian rule or is this universal? The idea you could have promotional boyfriends and girlfriends. Because I like a few AEW girlfriends. I'm talking to you, Anna Jay. And no, and not working for the promotion, just a fan of the promotion. And oh, and I take it, it back. It well, it is a Canadian thing. Remember, we've talked about the Canadian food standards and how you have to incinerate the hamburger meat and everything. They also have a, a government rule in Canada that if you are a, of the opposite sex but not married, you have to be chaperoned at all times while indoors by a dog. So, where'd you get the, sometimes where, where, where'd you find out, the, where'd you hear this? Well, okay, obviously that's what they're they're a, a law-abiding Canadians. They're Chuck and Laura and Stacy and. That's so Mr. weird. Bean. That's so weird that she wrote the email on behalf of this couple and basically said, the only reason I haven't been screwing her husband is this dog. The dog's yeah. gone. Yeah. The pants are off. Dog gone. <laughs> All right. One more. One more. <laughs> this is from Dave from Manchester, Manchester, England. Dave. Hey there, Jim and Brian. I'd just like to let you guys know that my family's beloved pet pig, Clyde, passed away due to old age. We nicknamed Clyde Russo due to the fact that he loved to lie in his own shit and stunk the backyard out. He was such a joy in all of our lives, and we will miss him dearly, and so will our pet chicken, Cluck Norris, because they were such <laughs> good pals. Clyde was a celebrity in the area with all the children coming to see him daily, bringing him bits of food. Clyde's favorite treat was a bottle of Bud, and we would share a couple of cold ones in the summer evenings. Clyde is now being cut up for his new home in our refrigerator, Waste Not, Want Not. Oh, what? I hate to that hear it, something like that. That was a twist ending. I love listening to you guys all the way from across the pond. He's going to eat his animal? Well, I guess, you know, Clyde's time came and time, Clyde's time has come. We're but the, anyway, we're ending on that note. Well, that's where we, that's where we ran out. So, all right, Clyde, yeah. we barely knew you, but hopefully at least they, they don't have to cook you too done over there. Cause this ain't Canada. It's Manchester, England. All right, I'll play the and outro that, music with and that. And that was, that was Reggie's Corner. This has been Reggie's Corner. Goodbye to our friends on the other side. On the next Reggie's Corner, we'll talk about a bunch more pets who died. Welcome to the big time, bitch! Woof, woof! Well, that's that's kind of unsavory also there to do that. But, um, Brian, we've been talking about our animals who have passed. Now are we talking about somebody whose goose may be cooked? I hate to hear this. What are these rumors? Uncle Dave is involved, so you don't know what to believe. But basically, the topic is CM Punk to the WWE, yay or nay? Whose side are you on? What are we hearing? What's the latest caca or gaga from the uh the scuttle butt of the of the butt of the scuttle well if you remember when we last talked about this i think was when dave reported that wwe i think that there was interest to have cm punk come back to wwe right was that what it was something of that nature and we said what well, duh you think and we laid out that survivor series is in the united center in chicago illinois which i mean obviously that's sold out already i'm sure if not it's going to be they don't need punk like AEW did to sell out the united center but my god the 
the response of a surprise debut would be massive, and that would lead to the Royal Rumble, and that would lead to the WrestleMania two nights. And who else in the wrestling industry, currently healthy and available to sign, is remotely as big a name, as controversial, or potentially as big of a draw as Punk? So, yeah, it kind of works. That's what we said. All right, and then I believe a report came out, and I don't have the original one in front of me. I was looking for it from Fightful, saying that WWE is not bringing CM Punk in. So then Dave Meltzer put out a second report, or at least this is on his website. WWE decides against hiring CM Punk. Dave Meltzer addressed the latest updates on Punk and WWE on his radio show. This is by Ian Carey. WWE has decided against bringing back CM Punk. Punk's intention to return to the company was reported in the latest edition of the Observer Newsletter, with sources from his camp stating that the two sides were in talks. He has a camp. Dave Meltzer provided an update on the situation during a special Tuesday night edition of Observer Radio. Here's a quote from Dave. They turned him down. The decision was a no. He wanted to go there, and the decision was a no. I mean, it can always change, and it was brought up to me that there is no such thing as no forever when it comes to WWE, but it's no for now. It's Vince's decision. Vince, Nick Khan, Paul Levesque, and obviously they decided that the negatives outweighed the positives. So what are your thoughts on this coming off the previous story? But now you glossed over something. He was reacting to something that Fightful reported, right? Well, it doesn't mention Fightful here, but I first saw the... The first person I saw report that WWE was denying that CM Punk was coming in was Fightful. Oh, yes, the point is, did did Fightful have all these details? Or did Fightful just say, well, now it looks like a no, and then Uncle Dave comes in, well, well, yeah, this and that and the other thing. Or where are these details coming from? I don't... I couldn't tell you that. And... Again, which we're going to talk about something here in in the in the next couple of minutes that makes me wonder why that Vince was the first one to be mentioned there when the next rumor that we're going to talk about is that Vince has been removed from the creative situation and Triple H is completely in charge. So if Vince said no then does that still count? (laughs) And uh, above all else, uh, what the fuck do they think if they ask somebody from the WWE whether they're going to bring CM Punk in as a surprise, are they going to say yes if they are or not? Do you see what I'm saying? Why would they? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's this great big surprise thing we're going to do. Nobody will expect it. It's going to happen in about six weeks or whatever. Why would they say that? So we ain't going to know till we know. If he don't show up in Chicago, then it may look dim. But right now, why would you tell Dave Meltzer or Fightful or anybody else if that's what it was going to be? Because the whole thing would have more impact as a surprise. That's my thought. Well, I want to ask you about the surprise aspect, but I have an additional report here. This is from a couple days ago from Fightful by Sean Ross Sapp. What WWE talent and staff has heard about a possible CM Punk return. CM Punk is the talk of the town once again, as virtually every outlet has reported what they have heard regarding he and WWE. Roll call. We're here. What? What? (laughs) What? I, I don't know what that is. WWE feels confident that CM Punk would come to WWE. CM Punk's termination from AEW led to questions about his future, including the possibility of a return to WWE. We've learned of what some within WWE think. WWE higher-ups fully believe that CM Punk would sign with the company if they had interest. In the past year, we've heard that Punk has been open to the idea, but WWE sources think The ball is in their court. As of two weeks ago, nobody within WWE had indicated that CM Punk and the company had talks. 
in late September, we were told that it appeared there were feelers out from Punk to WWE to see if there was any interest there. One WWE employee as of last month advised someone close to Punk that talking to Vince McMahon directly would have been the best course of action to secure a return to the company. In the past, we're told Vince McMahon was adamant to Fox that he wasn't interested in bringing Punk back, although Fox had been pushing for it before he went to AEW. Let's stop it there, because again, it ties back to Vince and the relationship between Punk and Vince. And I remember the the uh, uh, falderall or the conflagration or whatever when Punk showed up as an employee of Fox's rather than or being paid by Fox. I don't know if he was a employee with benefits, but he was being paid by Fox, not by WWE, to be on the program talking about the WWE. And that, at the time, people said, well, that should have led to something if something was going to happen. And it didn't. And to be honest, I don't think either one particularly wanted to do it at that point in time. I think things are a little bit different now. And again, if he, if... I don't want to spoil our next topic, but potentially if Vince did blow Punk off or did decide against Punk or any, you know, of any level of that in between, whatever, not ever, not know how, whatever the case, is that why maybe that Vince is being rumored to be away from creative now? Did Ari have a situation with Vince over this over potentially not wanting punk to come back in is there disagreement there amongst the higher ups because here's the thing whether punk talked directly to vince or not i don't think he's talking to any employees of the wwe that are talking to sean ross sap or dave Meltzer or anybody else he'd be talking to nick khan vince mcmahon triple h possibly even ari emmanuel bruce pritchard or Bruce Pritchard, and none of those people would be, if they did talk to Dave Meltzer or Sean Ross Sapp or anybody else, they would only be telling them what they wanted them to know. So, I'd, I'd, again, I don't see what's going on here exactly. It's not clear yet. Multiple sources we spoke to near Punk believe he would in fact sign with WWE. There is still a ton of heat on CM Punk in WWE, with plenty of it stemming from his last run almost 10 years ago. Sources familiar with the situation believe that many of them would be consulted in the event Punk would return to WWE, and to prevent anything similar uh, to what happened multiple times in All Elite so, Wrestling. So the people that I talked to in the company believed that they would, they would be asked if it was okay for Punk to come back. What? One top star said that Punk knows he, quote, wouldn't be able to pull any of his shit here. There's nobody here he could jump without getting his ass handed to him. End quote. When we brought I, up, I don't know. Come on. There's still a couple physical specimens on that roster that, <laughs> you know, you roll your eyes at. But nevertheless, again, is Dave assuming that this is a children's playground? No, this isn't or a Dave. Room? This is Fightful. Or, or Sean Ross or anybody else, they don't. Punk would know that. No, I'm not going to be face locking anybody there, but I'm probably not going to have to because they're not going to be running their dick lickers about me on fucking Twitter unless it's an office deal. Nobody's going to be doing anything in that company unless it's a goddamn office approved deal. So, again, I don't, I, I think he, they're automatically thinking, well, you know, Nick Khan is going to go to the goddamn locker room and take a vote on whether it's okay if he signs a big star for the company. I don't think they're going to go that deep as AEW did with the level of approval necessary. Whether they do it or not, they're not going to ask that deep about anybody. It's a goddamn business over there. Well, again, the article goes on from here. You can check it out at fightful.com. But the idea that there are some talent willing to, again, off the record as they would, but say negative things about CM Punk before any of this, who knows what the real high up talks are, but you brought up a surprise before. 
if you have CM Punk, and if you're going to do it in Chicago, A, could it even be a surprise? And B, would you want that as a surprise? Or would you want that to be something... You know, like when Jake the Snake was announced... A bad example, but when Jake the Snake was announced for the 1996 Royal Rumble, people paid to see him there. Like, oh shit, he's going to be there. Yes. He wasn't a surprise entrant. So with CM Punk, and again, if we're talking Chicago in the Survivor Series, could it be a surprise and should it be a surprise? And again, the real big thing is, could it be a surprise just because of all this kind of stuff getting out? Well, re remember in 1996, it wasn't always a guarantee that every pay-per-view even was going to sell out with the WWF business at that point in time. Or it, and then it was still uh, necessary to get people to buy the pay-per-view in large numbers over and above the live gate. So advertising a guy like Jake the Snake was a big deal toward doing both of those things. And it worked. As you said, people paid to see him because it had been a few years. But with again, with Punk, if they wanted to make an impact, he's been on national TV, even though not theirs, here for the past couple years, part of the time. But they're going to sell out the United Center. And Survivor Series, they don't need to sell pay-per-views anymore, but they're still going to do a massive viewership, but to make a moment to get, you know, started with something with Punk instead of just wasting his first match or just, hey, we're going to have him do a promo, what the fuck, let him be there. I think to see in front of that backdrop, that, that crowd, if he was to come out and it's right there. He's the most unpredictable man in fucking wrestling, the most dangerous man in fucking wrestling, the most controversial man, whatever superlative they wanted to go with. People love him. People hate him. The wrestlers love him. The wrestlers hate him. He gets in fights in the ring. He gets in fights in a locker room. He's a, a true lone wolf. You don't know where his head's at, but he's got a moral compass of some description that he sticks to, but he can do anything that he wants within that heel or baby face. And it's a, it's an impactful debut. So I don't, I don't think that would need to be advertised ahead of time because it would be, it would be an, an angle an advertisement to build to something that would be advertised ahead of time. You know, there seemed like there was a period of time where Vince could bring anyone in and everyone kind of, to the best of their ability, would accept them or understand that Vince wanted them there. And then after a while, it was kind of, especially with WCW closing, us versus them. And, you know, top talent, I, talent were given the right to kind of be a little more moody or picky with some of the people they worked with. <laughs> CM Punk coming back, how do you deal with the idea that there would be any talent or top talent that had an issue with it? Do you deal with it? Do you talk to them in advance? Do you explain... You're doing this for the good of your business? All of those things. And I think if, if anybody registered to who's in charge of talent relations these days, I don't know what the hierarchy is, but if anybody registered, hey, I've got a problem with this guy, I don't want to work with this guy, or I don't want to be in a locker room with this guy, I would imagine the first thing that they would do is bring all of those guys together, supervise, sit them down, talk it out, make an agreement of some, either some apology, some contrition, some mending of the fences, or an agreement to avoid each other, or whatever. But there wouldn't be any, it would be clearly delineated. There wouldn't be any bullshit allowed to linger as long as anybody was made aware of it. If somebody's going to sit in a corner in the locker room and just, boy, one of these gays, I'll get the chance to potato him in the fucking face. Well, they're not going to know about that, but that's not Punk's fault. So I would think that that would be handled at the start of the thing. And at the same point in time, if it's, you know, some fucking guy from NXT or a guy that's on the bubble after the last releases, and he's like, well, I got a problem with that guy. Well, okay, then be free, fly away. If it's Cena or goddamn L.A. Knight or any of these people, that would be an issue. But it ain't. What about Rollins? 
What about Owens? Um, I didn't know that Owens didn't like Punk. I'm just throwing names out there. I'm just throwing well, no. names out there. I, but Rollins, if that's a shoot, well, then they can either work together or they don't have to make that fucking match. I don't, uh, honestly, a lot of the guys on top in the WWE right now were not, were not there 10 years ago, were they? Well, Rollins, Reigns, Cody, even though, you know, it was a time away. I that, that, the I Usos. Think Punk, Punk and Cody would probably be fine because of business. You would think, and maybe it would become that way once doing business, but there are enough people there that were there 10 years ago, and again, you don't know, we don't know what anyone's problems with Punk would be specifically. Well, that, that's the thing. What I'm saying is, if Punk does not end up going to the WWE, it's because of, of I don't even want to say heat, but heat or lack of interest or the decision made by somebody in the office and administration at a high level, not because anybody on the roster was like, oh, don't bring that guy in. We don't like him. It'd be because there's still lingering dislike from one or more of the people whose names that I called out a little while ago. Well, one name you called out a little while ago was Vince McMahon. And he's in the news once again. Well, and yes, and you tell me now, because I understand there was a report that came in as we were about to record here today that has a few more details. But from what we're hearing now, Vince, as is this a recent thing? Do we know when did this elapse? But Vince has been asked to step aside from creative in favor of Triple H and concentrate on business, but staying away from again, creative and the interference that he's done in the past in television or talent or whatever, and it looks like it's working on TV. Is it working with Vince? I have an article here from SI.com by Justin Barrasso where fluffy stories go to float. <laughs> Triple H and Vince McMahon have more defined roles in WWE per Endeavor CEO Ari Emanuel Oh. Paul Triple H Levesque is in full control of WWE creative. And let me go down a little bit here. Paul Levesque in full control of WWE creative. When WWE merged with Endeavor last month, Paul Triple H Levesque did not receive a seat on the board of directors, a position he had held prior in WWE. Yet that has not represented a loss of power. In fact, the opposite has occurred. If you have noticed a change in WWE programming, you are not alone. Levesque, who is WWE's head of creative, has overseen all of the creative on SmackDown and Raw since the merger, which is precisely what his job description entails. The difference is that Vince McMahon, who is synonymous with all things WWE, is no longer directly involved in dictating that weekly creative in the same manner he once did. McMahon remained the title of executive chairman in WWE, but he no longer possesses majority control of the company. That has allowed for a change in the new regime, particularly in the creative department. Multiple contacts within the WWE and the UFC have confirmed that Ari Emanuel, who wields power as the Endeavor CEO, is behind the change. Emanuel has long been a firm believer that in order for an organization to be as effective as possible, people need to do the job they are assigned. In this case, the approach has empowered Levesque to exert full influence in the company's creative sphere. Not all is lost for McMahon. As executive chairman, his focus is elsewhere, particularly in overseeing a lucrative new media rights deal for Raw and the NXT brand, but it is a fascinating time for McMahon. No longer the be-all, end-all of WWE, McMahon possesses an ironclad contract that protects him financially, yet not politically. Will he view this as a loss of leverage? His response will be a very telling action. And there's the article. Per Ari Emanuel, Vince McMahon, nothing to do with creative, Triple H in charge, the TV has been better. The angles have been better. 
Well, and that also may give us on our previous topic something, some frame of reference, since that means that if uh, Punk has been discussing anything with him lately, it would probably be Triple H that would be involved because he, being the head of creative, is there lingering heat there, we wonder? And could you use that? I mean, if there was or wasn't, could you use that? And all of a sudden on these show, these general managers have to say that Ari Emanuel, the head of the company, has signed <laughs> CM Punk, and now Triple H has to deal with him. I mean, there, there are ways you, you know can, that would be brilliant. You could incorporate so much of this into the show because people would be intrigued enough to want to see the dynamics between these people. Yeah, that th uh, that would be brilliant, and it would give the people their look behind the curtain without really exposing anything that they didn't kind of already know anyway. And it and you could actually work things off of that that would be, but. Nevertheless, we may be doing their job for them, but if, if obviously they're on a roll creatively if Vince is out of that department because Vince's whims, as we know, can come at the last minute or he can, you know, he can tear shit up and start over because of something that doesn't sit right with him. And we've seen it happen millions of times. Now, they have been on a great run. Is it... Is it just because Vince had just it was too spread too thin, had lost some of his mental acuity or whatever that it was all over the place, and now it is coherent at least with the story they're trying to tell from start to finish without being interrupted, so that's helped, and they've gotten some talent over, and we'll find out over the long run whether Triple H is a an Eddie Graham level genius or whether he just leveled everything out to where it made sense long enough that some people got over. But I think as long as the, the media rights thing is still going on, Vince wanted that sale. He wants increases in all of the rights. He wants money, money, money. Yeah. Did Vince Ted Turner himself? Well, but, but not yet. If, see, here's what I'm saying right now. I don't think it's going to stress Vince not being involved in creative when the ratings are good. These negotiations are going on that keeps him busy. Yeah, he might see something on one of the programs and go, ah, what's he doing? But yeah, Paul, he's a son of, you know, right now, because he still wants to get hundreds of millions of dollars more for the next rights deal. And all this other stuff, and they're hot shotting that. But over the long run, once he makes all these deals and once he makes all these hundreds of millions of dollars more off the billions he just got, and he has time on his hands, and he's sitting <laughs> watching that show, and he's like, ah, goddamn Gargano. Yeah, see, or that's whatever. the thing. That's the thing right there. He, ne he didn't want to let go the last time they tried to force him to let go. So this time so, he was able to force his way back in and get this sale and get all this money and get stock that he could sell. But there's no way he doesn't want to actively be involved and dictate to people what they should do. And, uh, you know, I mean, when you think about what Triple H, now we find out, has done in the last few months, think about little things like Chad Gable going from being a complete comedy character to slowly morphing into here's him and his family in a serious thing with Gunther. Yeah. But I, I had you think Vince could let go of this, or is he going to fight back or try to fight? No, back? That, that's what I'm saying. Right now, everybody can can breathe, keep an eye out. Sooner or later, if he doesn't have more pressing matters, and he's going to start looking at the show, and then he's going to, you know, I'm not saying it'll be all out war with you know uh, Triple H to where they can't come to Christmas dinner, but frustrated Vince or grumpy Vince because he, because I've said before, whatever the topic is, he believes he sees things that other people don't, or he has the grip on it and other people don't. And a lot of times he's been right, but the, the times he's been wrong, we just don't talk about and move on. If, if, if you're part of the evil empire, that is. So eventually he's going to want to, stick a stick in that and stir it around somewhere. And that could probably be interesting. But if I was there, I'd keep him busy. Keep him very busy. 
That's what got him in trouble the last time. Well, no, I mean, keep, you know, idle hands are the devil's workshop. So keep him busy on work, on his business. And, and then ever, but at some point they're going to hear the announcement. The cake is in the oven. By the way, what the hell is he doing with the rights deal? He doesn't own the company anymore. He's just the chairman role, but it's really a non-active role. Who do you want negotiating? An agent like Nick Khan or any of the other people that Ari Emanuel is working for him or Vince McMahon? Who's going to well, get the best deal there? He's going to be thinking about it and he's going to be involved in it and he's going to be telling him what he thinks yeah. and he's going to be sitting in on some of it. What network and, wants that? And it's that? a good thing. It's a good thing because a lot of these people still see Vince McMahon as he created himself, the Walt Disney of wrestling. If you've got a network person in... in who doesn't read the goddamn daily wrestling websites. And there's yeah. Vince McMahon. There's and Uncle one Creepy. Of the... Uncle Creepy well, walks in with go. his fucking weird Clark no, no, Gable no. face. He does. He, lo he looks like Clark Gable's fucking Madame Tussaud figure is what he looks like. After a night in the heat. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He's slightly melting like Vincent Price in House of Wax. But uh, that means something to the network people to have the big agent and the big, you know, wrestling impresario. And so, yeah, they'll keep him busy. Triple H is the ultimate survivor. Do you think when Vince is pushed out completely, he'll divorce Stephanie? Oh, come on. How dare you think that I'm the man not would be as transactional as all that? I think he would, the first thing he'd do is draw up a contract for ownership of the children. And then... He would worry about his relationship. No, I'm sure they're perfectly happy. But you never know, Brian. You never know. You, you could be a billionaire one day ruling of an industry like a monopoly with an iron fist, and the next day you're just an employee that can be taken off the goddamn job, re removed to another department, reassigned, turned out in the street. You never know what could happen. You don't control your own destiny, Brian, anymore. In this, in this uncertain modern world, you do not control your own destiny. You're just a prawn in the game. And you know, you know what? I'll tell you, frankly, I think the only thing that we can do now to assure the future of ourselves and our families and our children and our descendants after the nuclear apocalypse, start hoarding precious metals. Have you got a hoard? I don't know where you're going or where you're coming from, quite frankly, but I don't know if we're worrying about nuclear apocalypse right now. And Well, you may not be worried about it up there in New Jersey because you get bigger problems up there in New Jersey with all of the shit you got going on in the, the delis, whether they're kosher or non-kosher. <laughs> but I'm worried down here in the American South because the, the world is uncertain and you can be terminated from your job or the market can go up and down. I was just over there at Kroger, the supermarket, and it was going up and down. They were raising it and moving it to another location because the people around here have lost all their money and can't afford to shop there anymore. It's all uncertain. But if you're looking, folks, for the secret to wealth preservation, then you can look no further now than nationwide coins. Because if you're concerned about uncertain times we're living in or looking to protect your financial future, then you can look no further. I think I said that. Don't look anymore. Take your glasses off. You found it. Nationwide coins. We, everybody's worried. What is happening over there? Everybody is worried. You got the debt ceiling, the government instability, the up and down stock market. I'm telling you, dig a hole in the backyard, folks. Transfer everything into gold, silver, precious metals. We're talking platinum titanium, uranium, all that kind of, I mean, it sounds like the lyrics of a super tramp song, but it's logical folks that you would want to hoard precious metals in order to indemnify yourself because it's always going to be good. This paper money with the, the pictures of our presidents on it. Well, that's going to go away someday. That's going to be out of fashion. Let's not make and, any declarations about currency. Well, it, uh, let me ask you what happened to the ancient Greeks currency. Is that still spendable? I mean, it's worth a lot of money if you have any of it. It's worth a lot of money if you got it. Are they making any more of it? Well, no. No, because it went out of style. It went out of fashion. These governments, they're not going to last that long. I mean, look at what's already happened to ours. And you never know. 
but it could have been 200 years, 500 years. In the overall scheme of things, don't end up like the ancient Greeks. The richest Greek son of a bitch that ever lived, if he had all of his money right now, well, he'd have a fortune because those would be Greek coins that were valuable, but you couldn't spend them just as... You couldn't take a Greek coin over to Walmart and buy a bookcase with it. There's got to be a middleman right. there, and they're going to take out a big percentage. So what do you... You need to stick to the precious metals because as the governments come and go... The bonds, look at Confederate money. Are you going anywhere with all this? I'm going somewhere. Confederate money, is that any good right now? No. Well, there you go. Well, they didn't make it out of gold. That's the problem. Because our friends at Nationwide Coins sell government gold <laughs> at cost. And that way you can keep the precious metals that were they were worth something back in the Greek times. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And if you want to hoard myrrh, and get with me after the show. But it was worth something in the ancient Greek times, and it's still worth something today. And they sell, as I mentioned, they being nationwide coins, sell government gold at cost. What government, you ask? The government. It's certified. And all new customers get their first ounce of gold without any dealer markup whatsoever. Nationwide Coins has precious metal consultants on staff that you can call Call on the phone and speak to to help guide you to the right gold purchase for whatever your unique situation may be. But they're one of the nation's leading precious metals firms with over 100 years of combined experience in the precious metals industry. Three guys, they're really old. They've got beards down to their crotches and together they've got a, but they've seen it all. And they're the exclusive su supplier of Don Everhart's signature coins. So after he broke up with his brother Phil, after all those hits, Don Everhart became the U.S. Mint's leading sculptor from 20, 2004 to 2017. And he was able to get out of there with a bunch of stuff in his suitcase, and he brought a bunch of ideas with him too. And they're just going crazy over there. Did you ever see that movie, Brian, how when they broke into the Mint and they actually stole the the press, uh, the uh, pressing things, the dyes that make the coins. Well, old Don, his briefcase weighed about 100 pounds when he got out of there. And this stuff is beautiful. They sent me a coin. The beautiful gold coin, the Standing Liberty on the front. It's a modern design with a classic homage to the yes. coins of days gone by. It's a beautiful coin. I have it here on my desk. I let the kids look you at it. You stole my coin? I have my own. They sent me one, oh. too. I didn't steal from you. Get well, I'm hold on. I'm checking to make sure mine's over here. All right, you're safe for right now. It's in a beautiful little display holder right over here on my trophy case. And again, they're just waiting to send you one. They've got an A-plus Better Business Bureau rating and a 4.6 out of a 5 on Trustpilot. So all the airlines are in favor of these people as well at Nationwide Coins. But never the And they're free shipping and insurance on all orders. You don't want gold just floating around out there uninsured. So, folks, again, if you've been thinking about exploring gold, hoarding precious metals in your home, in a hole in the backyard, possibly dig something underneath your house and make a concrete bunker, put as much gold down there as possible, and in bags, sturdy bags, so when the looters come after the apocalypse, you can wave this gold over your head and trounce them on the head with it creating massive hematomas on the looters. Go right now to nationwidecoins.com slash JCE and use the promo code JCE at checkout for your first one ounce gold coin without any dealer markup. It will not be marked up by a dealer in any way. It, there'll be no teeth marks on this gold coin. They've been tested uh, they don't use the, the, the bite method anymore on the gold coins. Brian, were you aware of this? They do not. Nationwide Coins is certainly not using the bite method on any of these fine coins that they're going to be distributing to the fine yes. people who purchase these coins. Yes, yes. Well, Underdog used to check. He was humble and lovable, though. But okay. you don't need to bite these gold coins. You know what I'm talking about. You always would bite a gold coin to make sure it was real. Because back in the days of the Old West, People would pass out counterfeit type of coins, and you'd have to bite on it. What was inside? Make Chocolate? Sure it was correct. 
And that was that it was part of the Lent people. They were marking that was and John <laughs> Fell came up with that idea, make fake gold coins with chocolate. Well no, John Fell was the whistleblower. He didn't do anything bad. No, he he came up with a great idea, and then they stole it, and then oh. they they fired him to get even, to get him out of there, so that they could steal oh. all his money. Well, Jim, let's get back to Nationwide Coins. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, just shine a light on the wall. Nationwidecoins.com/jce. Use the promo code JCE at checkout for your first one ounce gold coin without any dealer markup. Precious metals are always going to be worth something. That's why they're precious. And and metal. That's right. Nationwide coins. Once again, what's that promo code, Jim? I just said it. JCE. Nationwidecoins.com slash JCE. Use the promo code JCE at checkout. That's a good thing to remember all the time is JCE. Now let us know what you get. Let's see some pictures. I want to see what, what else other people got. <laughs> I want like to make sure I got the best stuff. I'd like to see some candid photography. Of... People's coins from Nationwide sure. Coins. Yeah, send me, send me a picture of your, your money pot there. All right, well, I guess, Brian, we should talk a little bit about the last uh, few wrestling shows to get that out of the way so we can have some more fun. Should we go ahead and do that? All right, we could pause the fun for a bit. Pause, pausing fun. They did SmackDown again. They seem to do it every week. It just, it, 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 as soon as you think you've watched it, it comes right back. This was for Friday the 13th of October. And oh, my beautiful star. That was, a, it's a Barnett line. And that was Jim Barnett's policy, right? Is stars. He had stars. And he'd walk into the locker room. Now, oh, look at all my wonderful stars. Because everybody, even though Barnett didn't book himself, he didn't, he wasn't the booker. He always employed a booker. He identified stars. He knew who could draw him money or who had drawn him money in other places in the past. And he would tell his booker, yes, bring this guy in and use this guy. And the booker could use other people if he wanted, but he needed to use Jim's guys. And when you looked at the locker room, you see that uh, like one of those pictures from, what, 1980, when Miss Lillian would visit the locker room. Everybody was different. Everybody was distinct. Everybody was a name in the wrestling business. But you could tell them all apart. Mr. Wrestling 2, there's the guy in the white and black mask, and he's standing next to Bullet Bob Armstrong, the Marine firefighter from Georgia with the great body, and he's next to fucking Wahoo McDaniel, the Native American great with the uh, pro football background and there's Abdullah, the butcher, the madman from the Sudan. And, but there's Tommy rich, the 21 year old, all shuck shit kicking country boy with the blonde hair that can sell his ass off. There weren't 18 cages and 15 pages and 42 people wearing masks that you couldn't tell apart. And everybody with the same hairstyle or physique or lack thereof. You get the picture, Brian. I get the picture. And I've seen the locker room picture from, uh, I guess, Marietta, I think, with yeah. President Carter's mom. And I mean, not all the heels were in it also, but you know what? That was the locker room. That was, everybody was different and distinct. That was, then they were stars. And what the WWE is doing now with SmackDown is just showing them stars. Stars, stars, stars. They're not really doing that. I mean, the opening segment was 17 minutes long. Yeah, they don't have to wrestle the stars. They just have to be there. No, they, they, they actually don't even have to say that much. They can just start to talk and be interrupted by music of more stars. And then they can stand in the ring and somebody could even say, now look, here's the right side of the star. And now he's going to turn and you can see his left side. It doesn't matter what they're doing when you get to a certain point. That's when the Attitude Era took off. I'm not saying this is a reprise of that level of success, but they come, John Cena comes out. This is the don't have an Attitude Era. Well, yeah, this is the don't, yeah, especially a bad one. But John Cena comes out, and they just they show the VTR of Cena and L.A. Knight beating Solo and Uso. And then as soon as 
Cena says welcome to SmackDown, they play Roman's music. And here comes Roman and Solo and Paul. Stars, stars. And as soon as Roman opens the show and says, acknowledge me, and they do the milking, and, you know, Roman gets out that Cena showed up when I took my leave, and you're calling yourself Cena the goat when I'm the goat, so leave or we're going to make you leave. And by the way, Paul's hair is black again. Does he, now at, at that point, hasn't the horse left the barn? Well, that's the thing. It went gray when Roman was gone. As soon as Roman showed up again, it went black. His health and his hair revolve around <laughs> him having the main event talent. It's brilliant, actually. <laughs> I th but he's not going to fool anybody with the hair now. Just leave it he, to gray. He hasn't fooled anyone with the hair in 30 years. Well, that's true. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so anyway, Cena basically said, hey, I acknowledge you, you your 1138-day reign, the greatest accomplishment. I'm not here to challenge you. But somebody else is, and they play L.A. Night music. <laughs> and, here, and here he gets a big ovation. Monster pop. And fucking the chants and the cheers. And then L.A. Knight cuts a little promo. Are you pissed in your pants yet, Roman? You're standing in my way, but I'm L.A. Knight and it's my game. And then there's a little besmirching and besnickering from Roman about L.A. Knight. And then suddenly Jimmy jumps L.A. from behind, but L.A. dumps him and bows back up to Roman and Roman slides out of the ring. You say and suddenly no. Jimmy wasn't even there the whole time. Yeah, he, he wasn't even there. No, he came in from from the from the crowd from behind. He was a complete surprise to all of us, including Roman. And Roman slid out and told Solo to get L.A. And Solo basically said tonight. So we got our main event. And they went to the break, and it's 17 minutes of just entrances of stars over and over. But it doesn't matter because I'm. That's probably going to be one of the highest rated segments of the show. And those fans paid attention. Those yeah, those fans were on every single word, and they were. I think the fact that it wasn't just Cena and Roman, the bloodline squaring off. The fact that it again goes back to Cena helping to elevate L.A. Knight. The fans may not have completely expected that. All of a sudden, L.A. Knight, who's being elevated by the fans, is about to interact with the biggest star in the company. Yeah, and and again, Cena is out before another little subtle thing, like we talked about the arm raising at the at the pay-per-view. Cena's out there and said, Hey, I'm not one to fight you, but this guy is, and it's almost like this guy is a bigger guy than me right now because of the way that's done. So it is star, 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 stars, all my wonderful stars. The only thing is, and I'll say it here. My only concern is if L.A. Knight's going to be used. I mean, unless you think this is the role it should be, is he going to be used as just a stepping stone to Roman Cody being months away? Well, because does that completely derail everything all of a sudden if he I mean, they're all of a sudden putting him in there with the main guy, Roman Reigns. But I think at the same time, if he acquits himself well and there's an out in the finish, then he can get a title shot, put Roman Reigns over, but still come out stronger, especially with the way he can talk. And I don't think it'll be viewed as a stepping stone if right away, then immediately, the next thing is not Cody just, well, I'm whipping Roman and boom and being done with it, or whoever's whipping Roman. So, because at this point, Roman Reigns has beat a lot of people. But, you know, it's a, a, a step up for L.A. Knight, especially from where he was a year ago, to just be in that match. So, but again, you've got, you've got baby, numerous baby faces for a war games or a bloodline versus whatever, or, you know, interchangeable at the top, which we were talking about several months ago. It was the exact opposite. Fuck, everything's the same. And if Jey Uso turns on Cody in a cage, you can recreate Dusty and Ole in 1980. Oh, good Lord. Ex well, except I don't think anybody's going to start climbing a son of a bitch to try to come help. Oh. I don't know if, if the people might go that far. 
But uh, but anyway, so they've started SmackDown off. We know what the main event is. There's more to come. But then, again, with the WWE, they're going to make their couple of points they want to make, and they're going to show you a lot of stars doing a lot of talking. But the first match was purely dreary versus the Brawling Brutes. And I don't know about you, but after that wheelchair video, I will never watch anything involving purely dreary ever. It's AEW level bad, that gimmick. I don't know what they're fucking thinking. I agree with you. And I had it on in the background, but I didn't pay much attention to it. That was when I muted that TV and went to the other monitor. There you go. Uh, but we were 35 minutes into the show by the time the interview and that match was over with. So. Bless them all. Carlito. Carlito is back. Carlito is bigger now than half the fucking roster. He, he, at one point, he was one of the smaller guys in OVW. And now he looks like a goddamn giant. But he's doing a promo in the back. And then Lashley walks in, and they do the backhanded compliment thing. And then Carlito goes, well, what, you know, we can fucking wrestle if you want or whatever. And the profits come from behind. And jump Carlito and beat him up. And there's poor Adam Pierce and the agents have to come in and is separated. Was this phony as fuck? Or was it just yes. me? Yes. No, it was like okay. Carlito. It was like Carlito never left and we're back to 2006. I mean, but it how why does this have to be done multiple times on every promotions program? Why would you acquiesce to doing a backstage interview? When obviously the people that want to jump you and kick the shit out of you are 20 feet away. And it happens over and over. <clears throat> anyway. They had a, a commercial spot, not in the network feed of SmackDown, for the November 1st AEW taping at the Yum Center here in Louisville. And they named off all the stars. Oh, you can see... This guy and that guy and the other guy and this guy and boy, howdy. That's a 22,000 seat building, Brian. And all I can say is it's going to be a dark day for AEW. Well, I, I, I don't, I don't see how they're going to make it look good. They barely got by with Rupp Arena and this is a hell of a fucking building to dress with three or four thousand people in it well they're trying if they're buying commercials on smackdown on uh the, at least the local network well goddamn if you were running a fucking show in a town wouldn't you that's that should be standard procedure was it a good they spot? do that everywhere was it a spot tailored to the wwe fan or was it just a generic not not generic commercial but just the regular commercial they would use no, well, it was a regular commercial, but I mean, with a specific voiceover, but the video background was just highlights of all the CMJF, C Chris Jericho, C, and they named off, and of course, they named off the EVPs. I don't know whether the Buckaroos or Twinkle Toes are drawing cards in Louisville these days. We'll find out. And and that's another thing. I don't know if all those people will actually end up being on the show, so we'll we'll have to monitor that. But if you're not buying commercials on any wrestling program in town when you're running a live event, what are you fucking spending your money on? Is there anything they could do, do you think, locally to promote this show that would actually help? Yes, do about six or eight weeks of real good television selling matches that the people are going to see here in Louisville. Is there anything they could spend money on or send people to do that wouldn't include good TV that they could do to help the show? Um, yeah, they could, again, they could do a media blitz like they did in New York. And I'm sure that, uh, well, Gilbert Corsi, uh, who was the OVW announcer is the afternoon anchor guy on the news at WDRB now. And he also does commentary for Dave Marquez's Derby city wrestling. That's part of his network. They shoot here every couple of months. And WDRB airs SmackDown. So the more I think of it, the more maybe WDRB probably wouldn't want to push AEW. But they could get, again, book people on local radio, television, ticket giveaways at, at this point would probably, because it's November 1st, we're two weeks away. If the AEW crowd 
hadn't decided by now they're probably not going. So, you know, again, at this point, two weeks out to start planning, it's a little, it's a little much. I don't know what they could do at this point that they have not already gotten the pipeline that could make an appreciable difference in, because didn't I see that they've sold less than 3,000 tickets? I haven't seen how many they've sold for that specific show, but ticket sales have been an issue. I will say, though, people in the company will point out that, although not a giant number, they have apparently a string of good walk-ups to some of these shows. Okay, if the walk-up is half of what the advance is, that means they're going to have 4,500 people. And the walk-up is never half of what the advance was anymore. So, no, it's a 22,000-seat building. How much does it cost to rent that? I can't even imagine. Is it union? I, in Louisville, probably, I don't think so. Probably not, but it would... It, Again, just to open the doors, just to have enough staff there so that people can't fucking go into blocked off areas and start fucking each other like used to happen in wrestling back in the good old days. You got to have enough people to watch that place and parking. And well, and the, actually the parking, there's garages all over downtown. So you're going to spend a lot of money to park. You're going to walk. Um, but just even opening the concession stands and ticket takers and people that have to be there when the doors of the building are open. It's, it's an expensive proposition. Anywho. Hey, hey but they, they sold a lot of tickets at Wembley. Well, then they can apply some of that money over here to the, what they're going to lose in Louisville. So while Pierce and the agents were helping Carlito Bailey and Zelina came in and argued with each other in front of this injured human. So Pierce got pissed and made a match between them. That'll teach him. And then finally, we go back to the bloodline locker room and Roman Reigns was great here. He has Jay. What are you doing? And or Jimmy, I'm sorry. He has Jimmy's. What are you doing? And Jimmy, so I'm, I'm, I'm calling audibles. You know, if it's a play don't work, I'm going to call some audible. And Roman's laughing at him. So you're the quarterback now, huh? You're the well, Jay's like, I, I'm, you're, you're the man. I'm second string. And Roman was tremendous here at, at making fun of him and being a smart ass, and then, and then starting to make him think that he was mad, and then said, nah, I'm just kidding, but what if I was mad? What if I really was? He's great. So anyway, he sends Jimmy out and says, Jay's old news. The tag belts matter. You got, you know, he's got Cody as his partner. That's a slap in our face. It just handle this shit and sends him out. And then we had Bel Belina. Bailey versus Zelina. Yes. Bolina. Bolina. Thumbelina. <laughs> if we could just get these pesky matches out of the way so we could get back to the bloodline. Bolina Carlisle. Bolina Carlisle lost that one. And then Bailey uh, got some heat and Charlotte saved. And you know, at this point, Brian, I was thinking if only, if only I could just listen to something else besides hearing all of the girl wrestlers argue and scream and and yell at each other. And maybe if I could just stick something in my ears and determine that I could play my own type of thing, play my own kind of music, live my own kind of life, march to the beat of my own drummer. Brian, have you ever heard of anything that's currently made in the world today that's manufactured, that's available on the market, that I could just stick in my ears and listen to pleasant things whenever I wanted to. Of course I'd know something I could recommend to you because it's not even just that. You can listen to this podcast while watching some of this crappy wrestling and you can do it on your Raycon earbuds. Oh, well, you, that's why I couldn't think of it because I can't believe it was on the tip of my tongue all along because Raycon has just recently made the news they've celebrated their sixth anniversary. They're six years old. But in, in, in human years, they've been around in business for literally hundreds of years with the new technology these days as quick as it moves, and they're right up on top of it. 
with the Raycon Everyday Wireless Earbuds that not only have the high quality audio and the thoughtful features, but also over the past year to celebrate that sixth anniversary, they've expanded their entire business with Raycon Home and Raycon Power Tech. I mean, the number six is the lucky number for Raycon. Like handsome Jimmy Valiant used to say when he was in a six-man tag. Woo, mercy. I love sixes. I've been married six times. I got six old ladies. I've been divorced seven. She's six on my chest. While I lay under the coffee table. Hey, that was Klondike Bill. <laughs> See that? You know, he, I that conflated got, the two stories. You conflated the two stories. <laughs> he was under the coffee table and Ricky and Robert walked in. It was Klondike Bill on his chest. Yes. The number six. No, it was Klondike Bill under the table. Well, nevertheless, you won't have to purchase these earbuds under the table because they're right out in front of God and everybody for you to purchase. And I'll tell you something else. They've got the the incredible sound features that we always mention include the awareness mode and the different ways that you can listen to the various sounds. Even Don Fallis's entrance music would sound good on the Raycon wireless earbuds. Now, it wouldn't do anything about his face, but that's, at least that's something. And right now, to thank everybody who's shown support for Raycon over the past six years, Raycon is offering 20% off everything on the site and select products up to 40%. So, and if you combine the 20 with the 40 and get the 60, well, then you're paying 40, which is less than 50, so automatically you're saving money. Well, I don't know if math works like that. So hold on and let's not. Well, no, let's not no. let's not check any of those facts. Let's just go with them as as stated facts. Well, no, let's not do that. And right now, again, the biggest sale of the year at Raycon, you can buy a pair and a spare and even two spares. And if you pick up two spares, you'll win that whole bowling game. And if you're rolling a bowling ball at something, folks, you want to be listening to good music or potentially some bowling lessons. So <laughs> the bowling lesson, the audio version of the bowling lesson. Yeah. Yes. It'll tell you how to pick up <laughs> that, that pair in the spare. But uh, nevertheless, right now, just go to buy Raycon. Do it quickly, folks, before you have time to think about what you're doing. Buy Raycon, B U Y R A Y C O N dot com slash J C E and use the code birthday. -na 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 -na. They say it's your birthday. The code is birthday to get 20 to 40% off side wide, depending on what it is you're purchasing and how much they're charging for it. Code birthday at buyraycon.com slash J C E, 20 to 40% off the earbuds. The Raycon Home, the Raycon Power, there's all kinds of stuff going on over at Raycon. That's right. Fine earbuds. We like them here in the house. I have a pair and all the That's kids right. have pairs. That's right. And, and you, you plant these buds, and within a season or two, they will grow into these massive stalks. Well, let's stalk our way back to WWE SmackDown. Well, we had come to the 9 o'clock hour, Brian, which is the, the wee bitching hour. And here came Triple H, entrance, in-ring promo. Again, stars, they remember who he is. They don't get to see him often. He got a better welcome than Vince was getting there at the end. And Triple H does the uh, makes the announcement that Adam Pearce, obviously, has done an incredible job as general manager of Raw and SmackDown, but now Triple H is going to give him some help. So Adam Pierce is promoted. Now, this was the, the verbiage I'm trying to get. Adam Pierce was promoted to the new general manager of Monday Night Raw. But the new general manager of SmackDown is, drum roll please, we'll get to that in a second, but I got to ask you this question first. If he's been the general manager of Raw and SmackDown, how is it a promotion for him to be the general manager of one, but not the other? Was he the general manager? I don't remember I that. Ever. That's what they said. How, no, but have they ever said that prior to this promo that, about that being his actual title and character? Well, he said he had done an incredible job as the general manager of Raw and SmackDown. Maybe he was only acting general manager. Because wasn't him and, uh, what's her name? Cruella? Wasn't him and what's his name? No, him is and that, Cruella. Is that proper fucking grammar? What, was Cruella also GM? 
I think she was. Man. Or she was either general manager or general woman or woman womanager. But nevertheless, drum roll, please. Hold on. Wait a minute. The new general manager of SmackDown is Nick Aldis, who has recently uh, come to the company as a producer and agent backstage, but now they have made him the general manager of SmackDown. Oh, I'm sorry. I neglected. Dominic came out first before we got that reveal. As soon as he said the new general manager of SmackDown is, Dominic came out. And was booed out of the arena, but at least they're leaving his microphone up at this point. And actually, let me just say, we got feedback from some listeners who attended SmackDown and were there for this. They said the boos were not piped in. For no, whatever as a matter, worth. As a matter of fact, Triple H made the, the statement, I always thought they were piping that stuff in. When he was standing there and hearing it, no, they're working with him. And that's what Dominic was pissed about the tag team title match. And that's when Triple H said, well, talk to the general manager of SmackDown, Nick Aldis. And Nick, he came in, no music, obviously, and stepped in from ringside rather than a big entrance because this audience didn't really know who the fuck he was. And there's no shame in that because he hasn't been on their television. And it was probably going to be somewhat popcorn fartish if they were to give him a grandiose music entrance. They used to try to give me music entrances in TNA all the time when I was the authority figure or whatever. I'd say, then do it in a break. Let me start out in a ring. I'm going to be out of breath by the time I get there. I need to take a second. Because the general, the, the, the authority figure does not normally need music. Nevertheless. He and by, looks and by great. the way, the fans didn't know Adam Pierce either when he first came in. Well, right, because he hadn't been on their television. And uh, their ratings are still bigger than everybody else's, so there is a significant part of the audience there that only watches their shows. But Nick looks great in the suit. He's, he's huge. He's obviously an ex-wrestler. I'm sure they'll flesh some of that story out as time goes on he can talk and that's what that's what tony needs that's what that's what AEW needs is somebody credible with the fans that is if if not they're if they're not an ex-wrestling wwe superstar they're at least obviously an ex-wrestler that has that background but that can talk that looks professional that knows how to fucking work these deals and, you know, it's that's the difference. So, and then Nick establishes himself as a baby face right off the bat by knocking Dominic, saying, hey, I'm a big fan of your father. And then again, Aldis's first act is to introduce SmackDown's newest star, the guy that came to SmackDown because Jay went to Raw when Cody manipulated that. And they play the music, and here comes Kevin Owens. And now, how does this affect him and his lifelong personal friend, Sami Zayn? They're split up again now? Yeah, if you see any of Raw, Sami made a big deal out of it. He's very upset. I'm sure he is. They, yeah, they For a shoot, they couldn't like be in the same match together in Ring of Honor. They had boo-boo face. They're very close. But anyway, he's now on SmackDown, and he comes in and gives Dominic a stunner and shakes hands with Aldis. And that establishes where everybody is, and we go immediately to the Bloodline locker room, and it's like now Owens and Cody and Roman is pissed and getting on fucking Jimmy, and he again, he's great. Because Roman has been is not going to put up with this calling the audibles from Jimmy thinking he's the fucking boss and there's going to be strife with that, we can tell. But again, just names, 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 names. And then a match and then names, names. We're going to get Pierce versus all this at WrestleMania? I hope not. <laughs> Come on. I hope not. Well, Pierce has been living high on the hog here lately, whereas Aldous has been hungry and still training. I'm afraid Adam may not be in... He might need... 
six or eight months to get ready. That's the good thing. If there ever is something where Raw and SmackDown start like feuding with each other or just the general managers don't like each other, these two could at least go at it at ringside I mean, or something. They could actually have one of the better matches on the card against each other. Whether yeah. anybody was into it or not, I don't know. And then we went to the back where Nick Aldis was there with Charlotte Flair. And next week she gets a title shot with EO. EO. EO, EO. EO, EO. Here we go again. But then Charlotte turns and runs smack dab face first into Triple H and Jane Cargill. And he introduces them and they make a catty remark and... And Charlotte walks off. WWE so, is so good at teasing shit. Yeah. <laughs> That's not coming oh. for a long time, but they make you already want it. Oh, it's, I mean, their middle finger is on the tip of everybody's taint on a regular basis. They're just tickling you, just teasing you. And it, Charlotte is good enough that if she and Jane had time to work some shit out, that could be. Jane Cargill could walk in with Charlotte Flair and have a better match than ever been had on in the AEW women's roster. Watch and see. And, and if they do it, it will be so embarrassing for her former employers. But anyway. What do you think of the way they're treating Jade so far? As far as they've had promo videos, they made a big deal out of her appearance at NXT. I mean, just her showing up and Shawn Michaels is there to greet her. Well, yeah, I mean, they didn't treat Cindy Lauper like this when she was the biggest musical star in the world. Yes, the treatment has been incredible. And just the way they're talking about her constantly, and she's important enough that the camera is there when she gets out of the fucking limo to come in the arena to watch the show. And every time we see her, she's dressed in something else, looks like, and that's not even her gear. We haven't even seen her gear yet. What the fuck? And, and they know, they have confidence that they cannot build somebody up like this that's going to be a popcorn fart when you see him wrestle. So they've got a plan and an opponent in mind, and they're probably already working that out. And if it's going to be Charlotte, like I said, with enough time to work that out out of the public eye and get familiar with each other, she can walk in and... and have the best match of her career with Charlotte and blow everything else out of the water she's ever done. And at this point, why give it away? I mean, that's the other thing. She yeah. would, if it was AEW, it would just be like, she'll be on Rampage Friday. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever we finally see her against one of the main event women, they're gonna they're gonna make it a big deal. I think you could bet you could bet your money or you could put it in nationwide coins. Either one, it's gonna be safe. So for the tag team championship, Jay Uso and Cody, who, as you will recall, just won that recently against Austin Theory and Grayson Waller. Again, what what has Austin Theory done to deserve this twit as a partner? What have we done that we have to watch Waller to see Cody and Theory? It looks like a before and after bodybuilding ad, doesn't it? The two of them standing there? Waller looks like <laughs> what Theory would be if Theory had no athletic ability, talent, it, incentive to work out, genetics. <laughs> yes, he's the 2023 Kota Ibushi version of Austin Theory. Wow. I mean, just what the fuck? It, he looks like the reasonably athletic celebrity that some local promotion booked into a mix match with the, the wrestlers. And... <laughs> And by the way, again, Jey Uso's open-handed punches are killing me. I mean, it's ridiculous. You, We have slow motion now, but you can see it in regular speed. For fuck's sake, I'm not saying draw back and hit the guy in the face as hard as you can. There's got to be a middle ground between that and whiffing an open-handed slap. So anyway... Again, it's the WWE. They had a nice little match where they went to break in two minutes and came back. And Cody gets a big comeback. And then they hit um, the old uh, fucking Theory with the double team Flapjack and Cody Cutter. 
And then Cody hit the crossroads one, two, three. They couldn't even beat Waller. Good God. But there was about six minutes of this on TV, and that, so it was a standard TV match. And on, on the way back, they do the, again a tease. Jay and Cody face off with Solo and Jimmy, and then Roman and Cody face off, and Aldis comes out to get in between them, so like Dana White. So the match was there just to fill some time and then tease something else. <sighs> yeah. Mm. So then, L.A. Knight, Solo, the main event. And once again, I liked this match with Solo better than most of them because Solo, as you've noticed, has a tendency to do the same kind of stuff over and over. And if it gets too long, he's doing it a lot of times in the same match. But L.A. Knight, as a more experienced pro wrestler rather than a performance center trained sports entertainer, knows how to put solo shit over and do different shit at the same time. Or just react to shit differently. So there was a little bit difference. Still went to break in two minutes. And Solo's the badass, so L.A. had to fight back from underneath. But again, like I said, a TV match, but different than normal. And you could see L.A. Knight was the traffic cop here, kind of directing everything. And finally, boom, he makes a big comeback, hits the power slam, the L.A. elbow, and then they have a double knockout, and Jimmy hits the ring. But Cena slides in in front of him and hits the AA on Jimmy and gets up and solo spikes Cena, and he turns around, Solo does, and L.A. Knight hits his finish on Solo, boom, one, two, three. It was a simple finish, but it worked. If you, if you overlook that guys sliding in the ring should still be a disqualification, but nobody calls it anymore, so they had a nice little finish involving Cena that validates L.A. Knight, who beats the street champion Solo, the enforcer, and that sets him up for Roman, who then hits the ring and spears L.A. Knight. And we're off the air. They made like three or four points in a two-hour show, and you can remember all of them. And they paraded a bunch of names around out there. And in the middle of it, they had some shit we don't care about. And that's why they're winning. And the big thing matters. And the big thing is clearly the bloodline and who they interact with. And L.A. Knight and the bloodline is now the big thing on the show. And it's clear as day. Well, before we move on, I mentioned, teased, if you will, um, what were the ratings? I don't even know, but I would imagine that they were fairly healthy and that the, the open may have been a very highly rated part of the program. Well, WWE, you, you don't need, you don't need to, we're not head to head. We don't need to go quarter by quarter, but what was the, the main takeaway? WWE SmackDown Friday, the 13th, October 13th, 2023. The overall number was, on average, 2,417,000. And that ain't bad. Two and a half million people in this day and age. And this is the program that's going to move off network television. But eh. nevertheless, what? Uh, how did the Open with the Stars stack up against the rest of the program? The Open with the Stars, quarter 1, 8 to 8.15 p.m., John Cena, Roman Reigns, L.A. Knight, The Bloodline, all in the ring for the live promo. 2,763,000 viewers. Where, obviously, with the average, they, they went down from there. How bad did it get? Well, for the end of that segment, into Pretty Deadly versus Ridge and Butch, 2,414,000. So they lost about 300,000. And then were they steady for the rest of the program? They were steady... 2,398,000, 2,304,000, the big nine o'clock hour, 2,520,000, a boost there for Triple H, and then incredibly consistent at the end, 2,312, 2,312,000, 2,314,000. <laughs> so again, they don't lose their audience, but they peak highly for the major names, and that Makes sense. 
if you're going to start watching a program, when do you start watching any program? And halfway through, say, you know, fuck this. This is the shits. I'm, I'm done here. Well, dynamite. Okay, well, you got me there. You got me there. But nevertheless, um, now that we've seen how the other half lives, let's go over to Monogram Pictures and look at Poverty Row. Hey, they had some the- good stuff, too. I'm a big fan of the Bowery Boy films. All right, so Hunts Hall and Leo Gorsi saved them from insolvency on numerous occasions, but the collision episode from Saturday night, October 14th, we're not going to go into granular detail on this, but what before we talk about the TV program that we watched, what am I hearing about the TV programs that they're trying to watch in the Jaguar Stadium? Have they not paid the cable bill over there at uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars? There were all of a sudden stories going around, more specifically pictures going around of, I guess, television monitors at the Jacksonville Jaguars game at the stadium in the big in the in the luxury boxes right i believe so i don't know if it was also the same situation all around the building because you know when you go to a game sometimes you can watch the game while you're online for beer or something you have it on monitors but apparently according to these photos and these stories the jaguars or whoever it is that pays the bills for the facility <laughs> had not paid for direct tv to be renewed the picture of the these big flat screen TVs and all these luxury boxes is a picture of the TV on, but instead of a program, it's a big box that says, to pay your bill, call 1-800-BLOW-ME or whatever. So apparently, I'm not saying they don't have the money. Maybe just nobody thought of it. So they can't even pay the cable bill in their own stadium. I wonder if the the luxury boxes do the uh, the diet cokes and the fucking hot dogs come COD? Well, they're right now trying to get, I believe, tax dollars to either build a new stadium or fix up their stadium. I'm not exactly sure. I'm not a big Jaguars fan. You know, you never know about the taxes. I did. I tell you one time the the first time when I was a teenager, the first time I went and tried to buy rubbers, they tried to hit me with this tax thing. I said, how much are these rubbers? He said, a dollar. I said, all right. I went to pay for them. He said, that'll be a dollar six. I said, what's the six cents for? He said, tax. I said, I don't need tax. I can hold them on myself. Well, beyond the awful humor, maybe you should go right for Adam Cole and Roddy Strong. Beyond that, what is your thought in general about the idea of tax dollars being used to build a stadium for a franchise, for whatever sport it may be, that a team owner will own? that the money goes to the person who owns the team. It's not like the money goes back to the taxpayer. What do you think about using that money? And at times, I think with the Braves, it was such a quick turnaround between Turner Field and their new stadium in Cobb County. It's an incredible turnaround. And now they renew stadiums or they get new stadiums quicker than they ever used to. What are your thoughts on tax dollars being used for that? Well, I hate a lot of the old stadiums and arenas being torn down to build new ones. Like you said, that is a thing. The because the old buildings had more character, the new buildings just, you know, eh, like everything new. But I can understand the process. These stadiums or big NBA arenas or big sporting arenas or whatever, they bring the big concerts, the big shows. People go downtown. They want to spend more money. They park. They eat. They whatever. It does stimulate the economy of the city, and it's a... You know, it's a bragging thing or it's a, you know, it's a landmark thing that can attract people and business and commerce and blah, blah, blah. That's the reason why they get tax breaks. But on the other hand, like you said, they do end up as a result of trying to revitalize their various cities, getting these things through to the benefit of these billionaires that already should be taxed until they're so broke they can't pay attention, these greedy, heartless, fucking, cold-hearted, goddamn. But besides that, you know, that's the thing you've got. The the city is trying to do something positive or the state or whatever by giving a tax break to get a big attraction built in their location to attract more people. But the taxpayer, that's that's actually what your tax dollars should go to is shit to make your city better and more successful 
But unfortunately, a byproduct of that is these rich fucks getting a sweet deal because they can say, well, I'll just build my stadium somewhere else. If you don't give me this deal, somebody else will. I'll take my team to Vegas. That's what they yeah. just did in Oakland. So they got to put up with that. Well, some people had to put up with AEW Collision yeah, this past week. Pay your cable bill, except if it's Spectrum. That is embarrassing. Anyway. The, the actual image said to pay your bill, go <laughs> to, to direct your TV. Bill. Here's how, since you obviously don't know. <laughs> Here's the procedure. You've never done this before. We have you on file. Hell of an operation. All right, anyway. Hell of an operation they got going over there. It's, it's, I'm telling you, it's, it's not a sloppy shop by any means. So I wanted to bring up a couple of things on Collision because now we see the other side of what they tried to open this show doing the same thing. Let's go out with a bunch of star power. But it got so goddamn confusing and so goddamn muddy. That's why I said you said originally I didn't watch that show. I said you got to see the first segment at least. Because however Tony's mind works, all this shit makes perfect sense to him. But he makes it so busy. And thing upon thing upon thing. And then there's always people going into business for themselves. Apparently that was the case here too. That by the time you get to the end of the thing, you don't remember what the point was that they started with that you were supposed to remember because they topped it with six others. Is that kind of a a summation of what was going on here in your mind, Brian. I thought this was a good introduction to Adam Copeland, what AEW is here in this segment. And there was a lot going on. Yeah. So there was a lot going on. And there was also the most interestingly dressed security guard I've seen in AEW. Well, that, that was what I was going to say. The <laughs> one thing that stood out that you wanted to know more about, you never heard shit about it. Who's that guy? <laughs> Who the fuck was that? So <laughs> Edge comes out to do an in-ring promo. But before he really gets to even say anything past that, you know, he's come to address, you know, what's happened between him, him and Christian Cage and a blah, blah, blah. Here comes Cage's music, and that interrupts with him and Nick Wayne and Dino Douche and the security force. He's got like six or seven security guys, and they always all look like indie guys wearing black shirts and black pants, and it says security. Except there was one guy in an odd color suit, to say the least, but he's wearing a suit. It looked like maybe it was that, that ultra suede from the 80s. And he was the biggest guy there, including Christian Cage. I think Dino was the only one that maybe had been bigger than he was. And he stood front and center in this security force out in front of Christian. And it was never explained. Who is this fucking guy? Why does he look like that? <laughs> he stands out. You would have thought that he was, Christian was going to say, well, I brought the goddamn most incredible fucking fighter from Bolivia or something. He was supposed to be somebody. No, this man is the modern Nikolai Volkov. He owns one suit, and he's going to wear it everywhere. Well, the point is that, that Christian is behind the security force that he's brought out so he can cut the promo and be unmolested, and he tells Edge to leave the ring or elsewise security is going to remove him and then cuts a promo on his match later on tonight with Brian Danielson, which naturally leads Danielson to come out. And he announces that he's talked to Tony Khan and that Dino Douche and Nick Wayne are banned from ringside in their match tonight. Which is a good thing, because the last thing I would want would be a member of the Blackpool Combat Club having unfair interference in one of their matches. That's right, because, and we'll talk about that in a minute, Danielson is the baby face in this equation wrestling the biggest heel in the company right now, Christian Cage, but he's still a member of the top heel group that's only heels kind of and not really for sure. So then when Danielson announces that Dino and, St and Nick Wayne are banned from ringside, naturally that 
means Ricky Starks' music is going to play. And here comes Starks and Big Bill. And they came out because he's saying they're taking up his time. And at that point, I'm like, what is this pointing to? We're starting to lose a little focus here. And then whatever the fuck Starks did <laughs> pissed Edge off enough that, that Edge started just blistering him, calling him a rock ripoff. You got your fucking clothes, your glass, everything from the rock. And he ju and just quick, too, just bam, bam. And you said you may have heard that Starks took a left turn on the material and, and pissed Edge off. What I've seen is rumors out there. I haven't talked to anyone about it. I haven't asked anyone. But apparently, you know, there are people who believe that maybe Starks went, as they say, off script. Or perhaps the comment about bug eyes or whatever it was. <laughs> something was said that maybe triggered Adam Copeland a little bit. Which is why he completely defanged the heel right to his face. <laughs> Just... Just the most <laughs> obvious <laughs> statement that at the same time was the cruelest thing that you can say about Scott. Yeah, you want to be the fucking rock. And uh, as a matter of fact, I wrote Edge Blister Starks with ad libs about being a rock ripoff because you could tell that was not in any way prepared material, nor did anybody know it was coming. And it looked like Starks was rattled for a second yeah. or two, trying to figure out what to say. And, and what could you say? Well, you kind of nailed me. You had my number as soon as I walked in the door. So then he tries to, Starks, tries to regroup and make a challenge for a fight with somebody at this point of some kind. And they play FTR's music. And I wrote Jesus more. And that now somebody out there, the AEW faithful, are going to say, well, they did the same thing in... On SmackDown, and you said it was stars. Yet yeah, John Cena, Paul Heyman, Roman Reigns, Cody Rhodes. I'm saying that, and there's some of these people that I like, but they're, and Adam Copeland, definitely brand new star, but the WWE brings them out and has them make one clear point. These guys are coming out and engaging in multiple different conversations with no nail being hit on the head and finally ftr cash said they were banged up last week but they still defended the belts and they lost them but there's they're still the best team <laughs> even though they don't have the belts the other guys were just better that night and they're gonna earn a rematch and then dax accepted whatever challenge i think that starks had made except that Danielson then said that he and Cage could fight right now, but they got a big fight with security, and then the heels bailed, but Danielson, technically in the heel group, even though he's a babyface, got the crossface on one of the security guys and held it on him until he passed out while the heels stood in the entranceway and kind of shook and shivered about it. And nobody told us who the guy in the fucking suit was or why he was dressed like that or why he looked better than the rest of the fucking talent. Yeah, when Christian had them all crouched down, he really stood out there yes, yes. because he's a big guy. So he's trying to crouch down, but he's still a big guy. <laughs> oh, so I mean, what came out of this? What clear point? What... I, I think a clear eight-man tag at some point came out of this. And as I said to you before he got there, Adam Copeland and FTR is a natural thing. They're all friends, and they would, would love to work together. And I'm sure we're going to start seeing these guys all together on this show. And, you know, the problem, too, is it's one thing when you're confronting someone in the ring and going at it with them. Everyone, and this is both companies, they come to the ring to, like, list off their credentials yeah. <laughs> to the person they're about to like go at it with. I heard you say all those things. Let me remind you of who I am and what my goals are in life. I was born a poor black child in a log cabin. <laughs> it, I know. That's a I reference know. to the jerk for anyone who's young and doesn't know what he's referencing. Go Google the jerk Steve yeah. Martin. Well, just go Google yourself. Why don't you, if you don't know what the jerk is, just go Google yourself. 
Oh, Harley, well, you okay? Let's get back to your special purpose here, Jim. I'm sorry. She's, uh, yeah. Well, my special purpose is taking care of Harley. She was eating her stick and got, <clears throat> she's better now. MJF went to an anti-Semitism conference after last week. Is not that an kind of not an anti-Semitism conference? A conference on dealing with anti-Semitism. The difference. Well, isn't that the same thing? No, an anti-Semitism conference could be like the KKK rally. Oh, the proponents of anti-Semitism. Well, like this was a a combating anti-Semitism conference, which again, after last week. I guess is the is that the Jewish equivalent of going to heaven saying some Hail Marys because you fucked up? Well, I would have to think that he was booked for this in advance of all this happening and the angle and everything. And it was a nice piece, and I thought it was actually an important piece, and they say the most important thing, or MJF does at the very end, that although we are a very small population here on planet Earth, the Jews are responsible for such a large percentage of religious-based hate crimes, it's ridiculous. And I thought it was good. That was the, the, that's what it was. It, see, this is the kind of thing they shoot. And hold your thought, but they shoot themselves in the foot because if this had stood alone, it would have been wonderful. Here's their world champion going out and doing a public service, social awareness, that whole thing. But it comes after the week they did the thing. And they have MJF talking with Robert Kraft, the owner of the New England Patriots, a billionaire in the piece. I believe it was him who put this whole thing together. And AEW thought it was important enough to leave in there where he says, everything's about this issue, except the one line where he goes, you work for a great family. <laughs> so AEW left it in there, this guy putting over the cons. And they did the same thing going to the video. They pitched it like, here's a video of MJF with Tony Khan's friend, Robert Kraft. <laughs> what is that? Well, you know, you got the pros and you got the cons. But other than that, I think it's good that MJF did that. I'm sure it was a good experience for him, I would hope. And I'm glad AEW is shining a light on this issue. As crazy as it may have been after what they did last week, doesn't take away from what they did, but it's a step in the right direction. It, uh, again, it just, you know, it could be so much more unencumbered with baggage. Some of these things, good things they do if they weren't doing some stupid things. Uh, Samoa Joe beat Willie Mack. I know Willie's family was upset about that. Did you see Action Andretti's promo pitching himself to hot and flexible? I saw her promo and then Action Andretti showing up and pitching himself to her. Again, <laughs> another guy that comes in there, here are my credentials, in case you haven't been watching this show that you're on on TV. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone, here are my credentials. And her and she... uh, Lexi Nair are having a great time together, it seems like. Uh, she's going to sign up some people. Miro don't want her to sign up people. And this little fucking nitwit comes in to like, he's going to hit on hot and flexible. The, we look at the state of him and he's again, the promo so dry. You had to listen to it in the rain. It just rehearsed words and like that she would be interested in him in some fashion. This is two companies in a row. They've teased these issues with them. It's like, it's like they're trying to John Tatum him. It's like, it's like he's doing everything he can to make it possible. You know, maybe it happened this time. I don't know what the hell it is, but again, well, issues but, with them. But action ain't going to last long. Uh, listen, well, well, they're, yeah. They're <laughs> yeah, that's right. Anyway, Juice Robinson against Christopher Daniels. They let Juice wrestle. And I haven't seen Chris Daniels wrestle in years now. And again, it was a nice wrestling match, and, and Daniels is always smooth. Nobody gives a shit. He's not only hadn't been on television in two years, he wasn't on TV regularly back then. And I, I think it, it, this match was, Juice is great, and he's actually a heel, but I think it was a bit too much of a competitive match considering who Chris Daniels is to how he's presented today versus the past. And finally, Juice hit his finish, one, two, three. There was really not any energy to the crowd at this point because, like I said, how were they in doubt of this? And it, it, some of these people may have never seen Chris Daniels at this point. So, nevertheless, then they beat him up some more, poor old Daniels. And then Juice did his promo with his foot on an immobile Christopher Daniels. And the promo was good because Juice can talk, but Daniel's laying there like a corpse, 
motionless for minutes at a time with nobody trying to help is a horrible, phony visual and distracting from the point they're trying to make because all anybody's doing is, oh, look, that guy had moved. Look, yeah, oh, that's, that's funny. He had moved. And then Jay White started talking after that while he's still not moving. And I fast-forwarded through Jay White because fuck, right? The king of but, listing his credentials during a promo. I, I don't know what it is. I, he could have read his grocery list. I don't care. But the point is, they walked out and left Daniels laying there, still hadn't moved. How do you take a serious angle and make it comedy? How do you take a promo that might impart some points that people need to know and make them not listen to it? You put phony, silly, visual bullshit like that in, and I've seen other people do it on multiple shows. They will have somebody lay there for minutes at a time while they talk. If this was if this was the UFC, the NBA, the NFL, the Major League Baseball, the goddamn Tiddlywinks Association, and somebody had been hurt, much less attacked, hurt by accident, and there's shit going on, aren't there going to be people trying to go in there and help the fucking guy? Not if it's the, not if it's the person doing talent relations, no. Oh God damn it! So anyway, that was the segment, and the takeaway was Chris Daniels was killed and left to rot and decompose in the middle of the ring. It, it, you don't have to do that. It's not. It's not going to draw any money. It's going to detract from what you're doing, talent. It's not a cool visual. It's stupid. But you know, at least Chris got a good night's sleep, Brian. How do you know that? I know that for a fact because he never got up. <laughs> that's no guarantee of a good night's sleep. Well, I mean, he liked it so much he didn't want to quit. Well, that's no guarantee of a good night's sleep, but we could find a way to guarantee a good night's sleep. Well, we can do that, but, you know, if you don't want to go to all the trouble of having a group of subpar wrestling heels kick the shit out of you on television, and then you lay there immobile and unconscious, possibly in a self-induced coma for hours at a time, if that doesn't sound like that's something that trips your trigger, folks, we got an easier way. We got a way that you can go to sleep, you can get up, you can watch TV, you can be as comfortable, as Mama Cornette used to say, as a bug in a rug, laying on your very own perfect sleep chair. And you don't have to do anything because the chair does everything for you. It lays you back. It flips you out. It stands you up. Well, it doesn't flip you it out. It folds you over. It doesn't do that. Stop saying things it doesn't do. What it well, does no, do... You can, you can literally... I've got one in my own home. And I've tried it out. You can never try all the positions because they're infinite. It's like the Kama Sutra of recliners. The positions are infinite. Everything adjusts. The feet thing comes up underneath you in a variety of locations. The back lays down or tilts up. The seat actually has a pitch to it. It can raise you up and lower you down. It can stand you up. If you don't want to sit in that chair anymore, you don't have to worry your little pee-picking heart about using your own muscles to get up. Well, this thing treats you like the, the true slug that you are. You complete waste of human flesh. You're going to grow into this chair because you never want to leave it. Because if you have to stand up, you just punch the button. Whoop, there you go. Right up. And it heats you. And it vibrates you. You can lay back in this thing perfectly perpendicular, prone as a goddamn day is long, and you can hit that heat, and you can hit that vibrator, and my God, you'll sweat 20 pounds off, and your teeth will be lolling around in your head like chiclets. No, it is nothing extreme like that. It is safe and comfortable and fun to use. Well, fun to use is not really the way to look at it, but... No, it, it is, is fun. Well, it, it may be fun for the kids. My kids like it. Actually, we're in the process. We're moving the one I have from the library up to the bedroom because it is such a good chair. I have now recently fallen asleep a couple times in it reading a book. So I'm going to bring it upstairs so I can fall asleep reading a book, watching me TV. 
There you, and then you don't even, then you take the bed right out of the bedroom. You don't need it. Just well, no, get no. the chair. Well, Suzanne's still in the bed. I'm going to just be in the perfect sleep chair. Well, put her on the back of the chair. On the back of the chair? Yeah. Put her piggyback. You know, like they ride the motorcycle and the girl's on the back. Put her on the back of the chair and ride around the bedroom. No, I'm, I'm want to sleep, not ride around the bedroom. Well, you don't have to sleep. I don't room. have to, but that's what I TV. I just said what I was looking to use it for. And you came up with some other scenario where like Batman and Robin were riding around in circles in her motorcycle. Well, it's a bat cycle to you. But if you want to watch your favorite TV show or you want to go to sleep or you want to read a book or you want to play with your puppy dog or you just want to revisit your special purpose in life, folks. Then you got to get the perfect sleep chair. Stick it in front of the TV or in the bedroom, out in the backyard. The squirrels will love it. Keep it indoors. That's probably the best bet to keep it in good condition and enjoy its fine functions, which require electricity. You're not much of an outdoorsman, are you? You know you can run a, a, a extension cord out the window. No one and wants have to power put the, in the yard all day long. Yeah, you could do lots of things, but no one would want to put their fine, beautiful, lovely, perfect sleep chair in an outdoor setting. But you've never been down south, have you? Most people have their finest furniture out on their front porch. Folks, if you'd like the perfect sleep chair that doesn't skimp on quality, is available in several fabrics, including genuine leather. And boy, those cows are pissed about that. Then all you've got to do right now is go to shopjourney.com. See, I threw you a curve there. It's not perfectsleepchair.com. It's shop journey.com s-h-o-p-j-o-u-r-n-e-y.com slash j-c-e and use the promo code j-c-e at checkout 125 dollars off your order brian is that the biggest discount we've ever perpetrated uh, i wouldn't use the word perpetrated but i believe that is the biggest discount the listeners have been offered and it's a fine discount for a fine chair a chair it's we love amazing here. And you will because if, if you add $125 to, to any other number, you're going to get a larger number. And that's what you need to do right now. If you're looking for the best chair to watch TV in this fall, read a book, fall asleep, play with your dog, have bedroom races, head to shopjourney.com slash JCE. Use the promo code JCE at checkout. $125 off your order of the perfect sleep chair that has sold more than 100,000 copies or chairs or whatever. Chairs. And they deliver it directly to you. So you don't have to worry about packing it home from a store on top of your car, strapped down like a, like a poor deer. Yeah, they, you just open the door and they bring it in. That's what happened to me. That's what they do. They deliver the way delivery works in the yes. typical fashion, as in the Can Miriam Webster. Can you explain delivery to us, to us laymen? A couple of fine gentlemen who have been checked out and we know that they are okay will bring <laughs> this giant chair into your did, home. Did they have to go through a body cavity search and any type of toxicology or did they, were they just given a quick glance and a once over? I think this is a fine question for the courier service, but here we're going to talk about the fine delivery we had of an amazing chair, which is the point of this whole thing. It's a wonderful, perfect, not only amazing, perfect. A perfect sleep chair. Perfect. The Kurt Hennig of recliners. Get it today. Very good. The Kurt Hennig of recliners, ladies and gentlemen, the perfect sleep chair. You want it. You need it. You can't live without it. You got to have it. Go now. Spend all your money. Shopjourney.com slash JCE, but save $125 with the promo code JCE. That's what I'd do if I were you. All right. Did you know they're plugging a sit-down interview for AEW Dynamite this week with Nick Wayne and his mother? I saw a graphic with Jim Ross, by the way. With Jim Ross. Poor... Talk about... Well, he's, he's looking to meet someone. It could be good. Oh, come on now. Wouldn't that be for a swerve? Sake. Wouldn't that be a swerve in the angle? Nick Wayne's mom starts dating Jim Ross. And Jim Ross adopts him and becomes his stepfather and takes him out to the woodshed. Now, I would, I would watch that on television. He may be a little too old to go to the woodshed with Jim Ross. Well, he'll go to the woodshed or he'll he'll shed something. All right, I'll tell you that. Um, 
here the thing you said it was a good introduction to Adam Copeland to what AEW is. Poor JR. Now he's doing sit down interviews with teenagers and their mothers. And I'm wondering is Nick Wayne's mom and Trent's mom going to have a fucking chicken fight in their minivans before this thing's over with? We should probably at some point draw up a list of how many family members of wrestlers we've met on AEW TV. <laughs> I'm not even joking. There's other and, ones. And, and then a, a notice of how many of them laughed when their family member was getting a shit kicked out of him. That's at least two moms I could think of. We met Jack Perry's mom and sister. I think that was Cash Wheeler's mom one of the times they were laughing at the heel. There's Trent's mom. There's Nick Wayne's mom. <laughs> and there's probably a bunch more I haven't thought of. Darby? Didn't Darby have a mother? I don't think Darby's had family there. At least none that I can remember. Moxley had his uh, mom there, I believe, or his Moxley's dad. Moxley's mom was in Cincinnati. Or was no, it Moxley's dad? Moxley's dad was in Cincinnati. Moxley's dad, so they had his yeah. dad there. Jade, when Jade was there, her husband and daughter were in the crowd and featured on TV. And again, like I said before, I thought of another four names. There are probably more that I'm not thinking of right now. And there's probably a bunch of people related to the Buckaroos by, by marriage that we're not even aware oh, of. Oh, their dad. Remember they did an angle where Jericho and MJF oh, yeah. beat up their dad and yes. he had ketchup all over his face? <laughs> uh, the world's oldest hippie. Buckaroo dad. All right. Anyway, speaking of hippies, so now they're giving uh, Kyle Fletcher of Ozzy Oldham. His partner, Mark Davis, is hurt. So Kyle Fletcher is now a juvenile delinquent single wrestler. He beat one of the fat boulder fellas and he's calling out twinkle toes is Kyle Fletcher for a big TV match upcoming. Someone wrote to us that the other guy in Aussie open looks like captain kangaroo. Bob Keeshan. Do you know that Bob Keeshan also was the original Clarabelle, the clown? I did know that. Yes. Well, see, and Mark Davis was not the original Clarabelle either. Did you ever see footage of the last ever howdy doody show episode? Is that when he dropped down and did duty right on the set? That never happened, at least not with that Howdy did... Duty, maybe Photo Duty. But no, this is where Clarabelle, it, the, the show closes. It's amazing. Clarabelle, for the first time ever, speaks and says goodbye to the kids. I remember. I while remember breaking that. down and crying. Like, that's the last image yeah. of the show. It's haunting almost. And well, he would later on go on to do horrible things with a moose and a, a man who lived in the barn. <laughs> so he didn't do any horrible things that we know about. Mr. Moose, they were always in conflict. And what, hey, what'd you think of Mr. Rogers growing up? I'd never watched Mr. Rogers. Never. That was that was after me, or ah. at least I wasn't aware of it. I was a more of a Presto the Magic Clown kid. Presto the Magic Clown. I don't know anything about him. On, w on WDRB, when they first came on the air in February of 1971, it was the after-school block of cartoons hosted by Presto the Magic Clown, who would do tricks of magic for the kids while he was... And he had a little animal sidekick, and then he'd introduce the cartoons and Speed Racer and things. Did he speak, or was he a mute? No, he spoke. Was the animal he, real or Because every time he did a trick, he said, Presto. Hence his name. Was the animal real or was it a puppet? The animal had a human being's hand up its ass. It didn't answer it my recovered, question. recovered, went into counseling, and then got this spot on Presto. Well, Presto change oh, back to AEW collision. So the 9 o'clock top of the hour segment on this program to try to draw viewers was a pre-tape in the back with the acclaimed and Billy Gunn where they told Caster that they were going to teach him how to make friends properly. And then they argued with the former Jericho jobbers. So apparently now Caster is awkward of some description. And that's why he's been reaching out to MJF and they're going to try to teach him how to make proper friends the proper way. It's all about the friendships, Brian. And they felt like that was what needed to be shown at the nine o'clock top of the hour to draw the viewers in and mesmerize them. By this point, but just for the record, I was already on mute, so I don't think I heard any of the rest of the show, but I saw some of the final match, but I don't remember anything else. Well, real quickly, Chris Statlander beat Blue Sky. Oh, I did watch that. That was all right. 
Yeah, yeah, I know why you watched it. Statlander's good. That's the only reason I watched it. Yeah, you're going to make an ass out of yourself with these comments. I didn't watch it the way everyone else does because of Sky Blue's ass. Everyone's obsessed with her ass. I got plenty of ass in my life. It's my obsession. It's my obsession. I like your ass. It's got such class. It's my obsession. Best ass in wrestling history. Who do you say? Um, Rick Rude. <laughs> All right, there's a swerve. All right, so anyway, that's when Kyle Fletcher called out Twinkle Toes. It's, so it's going to look like a junior high schooler against Harpo Marx. Then they played a video... Because apparently now Rush and Preston Vance, of course, the son of the legendary Vivian Vance, and some other guy, oh, an yeah. assistant Jose. Whatever happened to them? Well, they're, they're a group now, a group of cool people. And if you mess with the bull, you get the horns. Boy, what? According to Rush. Where we last saw them, wasn't there like a murder? And they were they, like... they mur Well, they were about to be murdered by a gang in Mexico that had kidnapped them, but then they made a comeback and cinematically murdered all those people and then walked out. And three <laughs> months later, they're, they're here with Rush. And cinematically murdered them. I like the way they you put They cinematically that. murdered them. There were no people actually harmed in the making of the motion picture. Uh, Keith Lee beat Turbo Floyd who apparently is the illegitimate son of Floyd R. Turbo, one of Johnny Carson's many Tonight Show characters. Keith Lee is dying his hair again, like Heyman, but again, the horse has left the barn. We know that he's a gray-headed, father-time, Fraser Crane-sounding fucking loss at this point, and I don't know why they're still trying. If they could have taken the Keith Lee that we saw about three years ago in NXT and harnessed him, kept his hair black and his taught him how to do a promo and maybe had him drop 20 or 50 pounds, you could have used that guy, but left to his own devices and exposed intermittently with months in between. He's just a big fat fucking draw on the payroll at this point, isn't he? You could say that about a lot of people there. I'm about to. So now Miro is pissed that Hot and Flexible is addicted to the spotlight and he's going to destroy every man to protect one woman. And, and that's fine. That's the story they're telling. Whoever his wife wants to manage in her Hot and Flexible way, he's going to be mad at because it gives her more attention and he wants her home barefoot and pregnant down on the farm. So I, that's a, a story that could be told. But then in the middle of this backstage pre-tape, he says that, and then he pulls Action Andretti in <laughs> under his arm like Action is already in pain, and then he throws him down. Like, he, just because this guy talked to his wife, he's... How did they shoot that? Did the production assistant say, okay, lights... Audio, we got speed. Okay, victim ready. Okay, and three, two. What the fuck? See, that's part of the thing, too. The earlier thing where Lexi Nair was interviewing CJ, Action Andretti walked up. It's the usual interview setting you see all throughout the show. Miro has a cinematic look to his promos. So that you would think they were pre-taped before the live promo earlier in the show. But no, in the cinematic universe of Miro, like Freddy Krueger will pull people into his dream or into, he would, I guess he would go into their dreams. Pull them in with him or pull yeah, them out or whatever. That's what Miro did. He pulled Action Andretti into this world of. But also, again, <laughs> the camera crew, the production assistant, the boom guy on the, on the boom mic. Are they, okay, yeah, you've uh, physically assaulted and criminally you know, fucking abused this guy, and now you're holding him against his will, and we're going to go ahead and roll the camera so you can talk for about 30 or 45 seconds before we reveal that you've got this fucking victim. And now you can actually, since you're holding him in a place against his will, we can add kidnapping to the charges, but we'll shoot it. We're not union. What the fuck? <clears throat> so anyway... Then we went to the main event, which was the only match that really I thought might be interesting, Brian Danielson against Christian Cage. And it was. It was an actual wrestling match with two professionals. 
and the level of the basics and the professionalism and the logic and the psychology on this show at least went through the roof when they got in the ring with each other and there was a clear baby face and a clear heel even though the baby face is part of the heel group as we mentioned blah 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 and that makes no sense but it, 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 again the best match on the show and two of the most talented guys at what they do brian danielson in the ring and he's a good promo christian cage's promos have never been better and he's the bond villain and correct me if i'm wrong brian but when they started this thing it was supposed to be bringing a fresh look to wrestling a revolutionary new product with young guys that we've never seen before and four years later, the best match on the program between two of the top guys in the current AEW promotion both spent at least their most successful years in the WWE, and both of them are in their mid-40s or older, and they outperform everybody else on the fucking roster, and they're put in the main event spot. Where did we just go around our elbow to get to our wrist? It became a second promotion, not an alternative to WWE. And you know, remember it, you know, it was gonna be a whole different feel. It doesn't have a different feel anymore. It feels like, unfortunately, a lot of the cast offs of WWE are here. And unfortunately, and not even unfortunately, but a lot of them are talented in the ring and good workers. Well, yeah, and that's that's the problem is is that the guys that are either too old for or are not in the favor of the WWE that they don't want to use them, they come over to the other company and are immediately head and shoulders above everybody else on the fucking card. That doesn't look good. What do you do about it? I don't know. But goddamn, the guy, the match with the combined age of ninety something was the longest match, the best match, the most professional match, and it involves two of the top guys in the company that are being featured as such because they know how to do this shit. Not because they were friends with somebody on the indies. So, finally, the fans were with it. Lots of big false finishes. Christian misses the spear. Danielson hits a knee and gets a two count. Danielson rolls into the LaBelle lock, but he can't get it with his bad arm. And you'll never guess what happened, Brian. What happened, Brian? My DVR froze because it was 10 o'clock. And they couldn't get the finish in on this show either. I see all the finishes on WWE. I don't see any of the finishes on these programs. No, SmackDown ends early every week. Yes, it ends two minutes. That's a Fox requirement because they're going into local news. Yeah. They got to get their last commercial break in and switch to local. Well, but nevertheless, so did I assume Christian won because it was for the title, but I don't know how. I believe that is correct. And uh, me too. Well, there you go. What in a wide, wide world of sports is going on over at the Arcadian Vanguard Network and the wrestling news arm of your massive media empire, O oh, Rupert Last? Oh, well, please don't call me that, but another fine week of programming on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. Of course, the wrestling news each and every day. Get your free wrestling daily newscast every morning from the wrestling news directly from the wrestling news.com or look for the wrestling news wherever you find your favorite podcasts including youtube the wrestling news also want to make mention this week's episode of stick to wrestling with john mcadam a look at wwf tv and everything happening in the fall of 1983 the calm before the storm jimmy snooker has already killed his girlfriend but vince mcmahon has yet to kill the territories a very interesting time in wrestling history. Hear it today at mcadampod.com or look for Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! Go through the archive today at 605pod.com or available wherever you find your favorite podcast. A new episode one of these days soon, I promise. The 605 Super Podcast. 
the mothership. Oop. Oh, my sound machine is flummoxing. That's the second time, right? That's the second different button that's short-circuited on you. I wonder, does this thing take a... Ah, it takes a battery. An LR44AG13. DC 1.5V43. All right, if someone, hearing, that. if someone hearing this can get on that, please. Thank you. Yes, can somebody... It sounded like I was giving out coded fucking army secrets in World War II. All righty then. So we thought we would have some fun today on the program by doing something that we did last month that got some nice feedback from some of our classic wrestling fans out there in the audience, and that's look at where I was at and what I was doing 40 years ago this month in, uh, in my wrestling career because, well, now that we have got past my debut... I've got all the my books for the next um what can we we can do about another 10 or 12 years of this. Once a month we where was I 40 years ago and it'll come out even. But you Brian kicking it up a notch you said well why don't we not only look at that but we've talked about that uh Bill Watts came to Memphis to look at talent in the middle of November, and that's what led to the big trade between Jarrett and Watts and us going to Louisiana and some guys, Rick Rude, getting his first spot coming to Memphis. But we haven't, we've looked at and talked about how the Mid-South wrestling business was down, but we've not looked at the Memphis business and how Jarrett was trying to improve his business with the talent trade at the same time. So we thought we'd do both of those things here today. Is that correct? That is correct. And again, we've kind of talked previously about a lot of this period of time. We just recently talked about at least your birthday in 1983, and that right. led to a little bit of a bigger discussion. But this is going to be right after that, October. And again, a lot of the fans like to hear about this stuff because it was actually interesting instead of what we have to deal with today. But in Memphis in 1983, and, and again, the reason why that not only because I was personally involved in this particular thing, but that we go back to Memphis a lot is because I can speak to that factually, not only from experience, but with documentation. Because I was either there or have the newspaper articles or things in my files. When the split happened, and we've talked about it in 1977 between Jarrett and Nick Goulas, it was such big news in Memphis that the the newspaper, the Memphis Commercial Appeal, did major stories on the promotion and wrestling and wrestling in Memphis, and they got figures from the Mid-South Coliseum, a city-owned building that couldn't be, I mean, down to the, to the cents on the money that wrestling took in and the rent that the Coliseum was paid by the wrestling promoters and et cetera and the TV ratings. You, this was not a promoter's... Um, hyperbole or press releases this was actual legitimate figures and you can kind of <clears throat> you know trace these things from that and and me not only documenting my payoffs but also the houses and etc so what had happened in memphis in 1983 as we've talked about before was that jerry lawler and Lance Russell had planned to split off and start running opposition to Jerry Jarrett in the spring of the year, stemming from Lawler being feeling misused or ill-used because Jarrett had just built that big 18,000-square-foot custom-made house on 100-something acres in Hendersonville, and Lawler was not a partner in the company, even though he was the star and, and had a piece of Memphis. So Lawler strong-armed his way into taking the book as a conciliatory measure for he and Lance not leaving Jarrett, which, as we've talked about, would have kind of doomed both of them in different ways. Hey, can I already stop you and ask a question? Yes. Because you were already working there, and you, of course, came in through Jerry Jarrett, although you always had a good relationship with Jerry Lawler. But before the housewarming party... What was the relationship like for the previous year between Dundee and Lawler? 
Um, because eighty two is also the year where Dundee gets uh, his jaw broken by Randy Savage, so a lot going right. on. What was the relationship between the two of them like before Lawler forced Dundee out of being the Booker? Well, I don't know that it was any different than it ever had been. And they had tons of respect for each other in the ring, and they could work together, and they had had the biggest money matches of modern-day Memphis. Lawler Dundee is bigger than Lawler Valiant, Lawler LaDuke, Lawler Idol, Lawler anybody in the local fans' memories because it did so well, and they went back to it so many times, and the matches were so good. But outside the ring, they were completely opposite people. Dundee was a workaholic. He loved the booking. He loved going to the office, working with Jarrett and learning. Lawler would write the TV. <laughs> when he got to Channel 5 at 10 o'clock, we were going on the air live at 11. Then Dundee was like most of the boys. He would stop at the liquor store and get a six-pack of beer on the way back or a 12-pack or whatever. Lawler would stop at McDonald's and eat a Big Mac. Um, Dundee dressed like Elvis, but Lawler did records like Elvis and wanted to be the king of Memphis. There was, there was enough about each other that were different that personally they could needle each other intentionally or unintentionally. And there was always competition because Lawler was the star and Dundee was never going to get over him. Dundee got over everybody else. So he, but he was always going to be the, the number two babyface, unless he switched heel, in which case he could work with Lawler on top and be the number one heel, which they did at some points. And Dundee worked harder at the wrestling business, but Lawler was such a natural at it that it just rolled off of him. So they each had points where they were in the other guy's way. But Lawler wasn't trying to get even with Dundee, Lawler was trying to pull a power play on Jarrett and Dundee just happened to be in the way. So that's how that happened. Lawler said, I'll be a partner and I'll be the booker because the reason why he had, I don't know that Lawler wanted to be the booker, but he had a whole crew of guys standing ready to come into his promotion that he had promised jobs to. And so he had to use all those guys. So it, that meant that if he wasn't open at his own office, he had to bring him into the existing one. And that meant all of Dundee's guys that he'd brought in as Booker had to go, which they remember the St. Valentine's Day massacre of my dynasty of champions was all in one night with the eight-man loser-leave-town match. But that's what, it, it wasn't him saying, I'll get you, Dundee. It was like, I'm going to get half of this company and I've got these guys that, are my guys that I'm bringing in, so Dundee's got to go. But would he have been unhappy with Dundee's style of booking and what he was specifically booking in 1982 leading into this period of time? I mean, it was no consideration to, I'll be part owner now, and you can just continue doing what you're doing. Well, no, because again, Lawler really, when Dundee was booking, Lawler booked whatever he was doing in Memphis anyway. And usually had pretty much input, that meant that whatever was going to go on in Louisville, Lexington, wherever was going to come off of that unless they couldn't get the big name to, co to go to all those towns. So Dundee being the booker didn't hamper Lawler that much to begin with. It's just, you know, here we go. And that's why that they ended up switching Dundee heel at that point to work with Lawler on the way out. But before he worked with Lawler on the way out. He worked with all the other baby faces and had with Dutch and, you know, had several programs to get him ready as a heel for Lawler. And then they did the loser leave town, 11,000, whatever people, $46,000 complete sellout. And then Dundee's moved down to Georgia with all of us. If, if I could ask another question, it had been a long time since Dundee had been a heel and as a babyface, although popular, he may not have always been the greatest promo. Right. <laughs> were, you were you surprised how good he was as a heel in 1983? No. no, because that was the real Bill Dundee. He couldn't even be nice in a goddamn conversation. He could be funny, and he didn't have to be screaming at you and cussing you, but he was a natural heel. He was a natural smartass, a natural shit disturber. He had that... 
impish twinkle in his eye when he did it sometimes, but he was a baby face because he was so cute. The girls loved him. But after a period of time, you know, when he get the, he had a bunch of baby faces for the girls, switch Dundee heel, and the real Bill Dundee comes out in the promos. And then you could believe him. And he was a great worker either way. So, and, and he had come in as a heel with him and, and George Barnes, but Barnes did most of the talking back then. So Dundee had never really been the promo guy, but then that, that heel run in 83 is what really kicked it. And he'd been in the territory eight years and was the number two guy already, not doing really good promos. But that's the point is that once that Dundee's guys were moved out and Lawler was the booker, now Lawler's got to not only generate money, but prove himself a little bit. And Lawler had already got, had already been, had the deal for years where he would get 10% of the gate in Memphis for his match. So now he's the booker. So whatever decisions he makes about Memphis directly affects his payoff in a major way because Memphis is doing 20 grand every week. And Lawler and Bockwinkle could get it up to, in January, they did 32 grand. I mean, he was making $3,200 for that one match that one night. Now, in 1983, a dollar was worth, in today's money, according to the inflation calculator, about $3.09. So you're tripling every figure that I'm going to give from 1983. So if Lawler is making two and three thousand dollars every Monday night, fifty-two weeks a year, plus the rest of his wrestling pay, plus he owns half the fucking promotion, I think we've established again why he never left and went to other territories. But so, and he wasn't a big spender. And uh, no, not uh, you know. Well, he bought a Batmobile, but you know that was years later. But again, it wasn't later. like Ric Flair out there, you know, spending everything. No, he no, earned. no. And uh, you know, never took a drug or drank a alcoholic drink in his life. And you know, he spent a lot of money on pussy, didn't we all? <laughs> Nevertheless, so where Dundee was different as a booker is Dundee worked more closely with Jared. He was more attuned to the bottom line. If you go back and look. Even in Memphis, which was the biggest cards, there were 20 guys on the card. Maybe there were six or seven, maybe eight matches. A couple of underneath local guys in Memphis to make it bigger. Louisville, Evansville, you'd get five, six matches. 16, 18 guys on the card. Now, whereas Dundee, in early 83, under his booking, except, like I said, for Lawler and Bockwinkle, they did 9,000 people one week. Dundee was doing between five and 7,000 people every week in Memphis. It wasn't horrible. It wasn't great. It wasn't record setting. wasn't about to go out of business. That was pretty good in the middle. But he was doing those five, six, 7,000 people crowds with 18 to 20 guys on the card. Lawler takes over the book. He gets rid of a lot of guys, but he also brings a lot of guys in. And as I've mentioned, Lawler... A lot of times wouldn't say no to guys that were asking for a job. He'd say, sure. And then he'd start booking them. And when he realized he had too many guys, he just wouldn't book you until you just left. And he, ah, oh, shit, I wish we could do better for you. And he'd somehow have no heat with people. So I, I wanted to read you this. Like I said, in March, they've got 18, 20 guys on the card. By the time Lawler, and we'll talk in a little bit more detail about who came in and what the booking was, but by the time that the Halloween show came around, the opening match was an eight-man tag. I was in it, and there were eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two. 33 guys on the card plus a couple of referees and Jimmy Hart was managing five of the matches. And it, it, Lawler's crowds after the summer, which was always the big period for Memphis, they had been above the five to seven. They'd been more like six to 8,000. 
You draw on an extra thousand or two people, you got 12 more guys on the card to pay. And then when it dropped, now you've got 32 guys on the card and you're drawing 4,000 people. So therein lay the problem. Lawler was a genius at booking himself and was pretty good at hot shotting for a little while, but he didn't he didn't want to spend the time, nor was it his nature to really obsess over this shit. And he wasn't good with his fiscal conservatism on the bottom line of expenses versus revenue. So once he took the book over, immediately, as I said, they switched Dundee heel and, and started getting that ready. First Dundee worked with Dutch, but meanwhile, Lawler was bringing in names to work with him. April 25th, he brought Tully Blanchard in to work an international title match. Um, May 9th, and now the fabulous ones were here. This was the thing that was a little different about the last time Lawler had been sole booker. The fabs were still here. Stan Lane and Steve Kern. That was Jerry Jarrett's prize gimmick. So Jarrett still had a hand in the fabs. So he brought Fargo back. And Lawler's not going to say anything about that because Jackie Fargo was his mentor. But then whereas... Lawler was starting to work with some of the heels that Andy Kaufman would work with. The Fabs were working with the Moondogs, who were managed by Jimmy Hart. So Lawler was A-OK -okay with that as well. They brought Jackie Fargo in. They hurt Kern and had Stan and Jackie Fargo on top against the Moondogs and drew almost 8,000 people because Fargo hadn't wrestled there in years. What'd you think about it when the Moondogs hit Memphis? Because there was a WWF creation, that tag team, and then eventually Larry Latham got brought up and put into the group. But what did you think when they hit Memphis? Well, see, the thing is, nobody in Memphis had ever seen the Moondogs in the WWF because the there was right. no crossover of television and there was no home video really at that point. And Larry Latham had started out, he was from Arkansas, and he started out in Memphis and became one of the Blonde Bombers with Wayne Ferris, so we knew Larry. And Randy Colley was an old Southern guy and had been one of the assassins and blah, blah, blah. So, and they were perfect for Memphis with the chairs and the tables and the craziness. They didn't really, they didn't do the Moondogs in the WWF. They wouldn't have allowed that, that kind of insanity. But it was great for Memphis and with the Fabs and... Fargo then coming in and doing the furniture match and giving the moon dogs taste their own medicine. Those matches were insane. They were, they were drawing on the cards they were on equivalent to what Lawler was doing. And then Lawler brought Patera in and worked with Ken Patera. And then Austin Idol, because Lawler enjoyed, you know, working with Idol or having Idol as a, a baby face there. That's how you could tell that Lawler was doing his own thing without Jerry Jarrett's input, because Jerry Jarrett did not like Austin Idol. Well, yeah, because of the money and the issues, and you never knew what was going to happen, but Lawler, Austin Idol was another plowboy Frazier to Lawler. He's going to use him. And then they brought Stan Hansen in, and then the rib was that Lawler was working with Patera, who was easy, and they put Idol in with Stan Hansen. He was beating the shit out of Idol every night, and I was like, fuck! Lighten up, brother! But then again, you know what? Here, can I tell you something? Yeah. Years ago when I had the show Austin Idol live with me and Austin Idol, it was a great show for 30 episodes and I'm still friends with Idol, but we had Stan Hansen on and Idol's like, oh, you know, Stan, do you remember Memphis? Do you remember working with me at Memphis? He's like, yeah, you got me fired. <laughs> <laughs> you said I hit you too hard. <laughs> But here, here's an example, July the 4th, 1983. I was down in Georgia. I wasn't, th I wasn't even there. But they had a big July 4th card at the Coliseum. But this is what Lawler booked that drew 8,774 people. Pretty good for a weekly town. But Ted Allen versus Ken Timms, Tommy Gilbert versus Galaxian One, Don Anderson versus Jimmy Kent, Dutch Mantell versus Duke Myers, Tom Pritchard and Lone Eagle, versus the giant rebel who was Plowboy Frazier and Little Tokyo in a mixed man and midget tag match. The Rock and Roll Express, Steve Regal, not William Regal, the one from Indiana, 
Spike Huber and Mad Dog Boyd against the Bruise Brothers, the Grappler, and Man Mountain Link. Mad Dog Boyd against the Bruise Brothers? Mad Dog switched babyface when Dream Machine came in to take his place because Mad Dog was the shits in the ring. Yeah. But, but the boys liked him. So they replaced him it, teaming with Pork Chop with Troy Graham, but Mad Dog for the Memphis end because he lived there. The people kind of liked him, so Lawler booked him as a babyface for a few weeks. That's when Bobby Eaton had to do the dog food match, where if Mad Dog beat him, he had to eat a can of dog food. And they put the goddamn beef stew with the dog food label, but it was cold beef stew, and Bobby had a touchy stomach, so he threw up anyway. But then continuing this card, Mid-America title, Stagger Lee, who was Coco Ware against Cowboy Frankie Lane. A cage match with the Fabs and Austin Idol against the Moondogs and Bobby Eaton. Jerry Lawler in a handicap match against Jimmy Hart and Andy Kaufman. And a 30-man battle royal for a 1984 Corvette that Lawler bought himself, so he won the battle royal. That drew almost 9,000 people, but the first five matches were immaterial to any goddamn thing. It was just too many people on the fucking cards, right? And by the end of the summer, when they had seen eight mans and ten mans and Jimmy Hart doing everything and Andy Kaufman managing every wrestler against Lawler and Ken Patera and the Assassins and Austin Idol, and then they brought Handsome Jimmy back because the six mans with Handsome Jimmy, oh, there was yeah. one. And by the way, that was in the middle of his hottest run in Mid Atlantic. Yes. But they they had to, because again, Valiant could leave the Mid-Atlantic Territory and not go to Greenville, South Carolina on Monday night and come over to Memphis and they would sell out. And he'd make probably $1,500, which would be $4,500 today. Because they did two six-mans in a row, Lawler, Idol, and Jimmy Valiant against the Assassins and Ken Patera and sold out the first week and did almost 8,000 the second week. And then I was back for this. This was the goddamnedest thing. The, um, oh, wait a minute. Here's another card. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten matches, six title matches, and one of the prelims was an eight-man tag. He just couldn't hold the cards down. And uh, then they brought in the uh, the San Diego Chicken because Lawler was a big baseball fan and he was the hot mascot at the time. The world famous chicken. The world famous. Well, no, he was still a San Diego Chicken was back he? then. I thought. Hold on, let me remember the guy that. lost the rights to use that name. He had to call himself the no, world famous. No, the chicken. San Diego Chicken. He was still on October third, nineteen eighty three. Lawler with the San Diego Chicken against Jesse Ventura with Jimmy Hart for the Southern title, no time limit, no disqualification. And the deal was, if Ventura lost, he had to wear the chicken suit. Well, of course, not only did Ventura lose, but he's not going to wear the chicken suit. So they said, well, it won't fit Ventura, so Hart had to wear the chicken suit. And he wore it for a week in all the towns around Memphis because people would know, right? So that's when I had a team with him in Blytheville, Arkansas that night when he was wearing a chicken suit. Nevertheless, then the main event on October 17th was a 12-man hospital elimination tag team match. And it was the Assassins, who were Roger Smith and Donnie Bass, Buddy Landell, Dennis Condry, Norvell Austin, and Jesse Ventura against... The Fabulous Ones, Austin Idol, Jimmy Valiant, Jerry Lawler, and Rough House Fargo. And Brian, do you know what the rules of a hospital elimination match is? Uh, I do not, know. In Tennessee, a hospital elimination match was when a man is cut and bleeding, he is eliminated. And the last man not bleeding in the ring is the winner. Well, this was a 12-man. David had Rough House get juice. They had, a, they had like 10 or 11 of the guys get color, and this was on top. As a matter of fact, that was the main event the night that me and Hart had our match with Bobby where the fans hit the ring to retrieve the money that we talked about a week or two ago. 
so the point is the cards were just huge. There was so many guys. And even if they were doing, you know, six and 7,000, 8,000 people a week, it wasn't as profitable as it had been when they were doing five or six with the extra guys and things. And then he'd hot shotted so much through the, through the year or through the summer, which was always the good time for Tennessee anyway, that by the time October and November rolled around, listen to these weeks. The 7,288 people was for one of the, the second six-man tag, right? But then they were down to 3915, 4605, 3906, 3800, 3841. And that's when Watts showed up. For about six weeks or so, the, even Andy Kaufman wasn't new anymore. And the handicap boxing and wrestling match, Lawler versus Jimmy Hart and Andy Kaufman, 3,800 people. It, it, the cards were huge. There were so many guys, and the, the money wasn't there at the houses. That's when, similarly, Watts, his business was down in Louisiana. And as promoters and their territories bordering each other, they started talking. Watts wanted talent. You could turn Memphis on a dime. As witnessed by that day in 1979, Fuller takes the crew back to Knoxville. They leave on a Thursday. Jarrett shoots an angle on a Friday, airs it on live TV on Saturday, main events with it on Monday night, and the following week it goes to the rest of the territory, and you've changed direction completely. Watts couldn't do that. He had multiple TV markets of similar size and importance, and the tape, as we've talked about, bicycled around. From the time that you shot the show in Shreveport until the time that it aired in its final markets out in Oklahoma City and Tulsa was five weeks. Watts needed a new booker. Watts needed talent that he could build over a period of a couple or three months and to re-rack his entire operation. Because of the way Memphis was laid out, what Jarrett needed to do was just get rid of all the extra guys that he didn't need or want and take a little bit more control of the, the booking of the cards and get Lawler one new money-drawn opponent. And he didn't even have to get him from Watts. He got Randy Savage. Because as we've talked about, when Dundee went to work for Watts, that opened the door for Savage to come work for Jarrett. And Watts had been building up Randy Savage on his TV. And then all of a sudden, Bill Dundee was made the booker. Right. Randy Savage had to have somewhere to go. It, well, worked, it, worked, also, out, it worked out for everyone. It were, But also, Watts saw that it was more important for him to have multiple talents that he could build around and a booker to implement what he wanted than just to have a talent like Randy Savage, but not change anything else. So Watts ended up getting guys that he could draw money with, with a push that hadn't been used in Memphis because there was too many guys. And Watts got a new booker with fresh finishes and Jarrett cut the fat off of his roster to make it more affordable going into the winter months and got one guy in Randy Savage that he could make dream matches with that had not been seen in his territory, but had been being promoted for years. So that's why they did that switch. But as we've talked about, you know, Mid-South being down until we all got there, Memphis again, except for 8,000 people for the first Lawler and Savage match on December 5th, right after we had all left. Um, my God, well, there was 2,800 or 2,480 people there on December 19th, but that sounds like a weather-related issue because the next week was 6,450. So when you saw an outlier like that, but it was bad. And, and so... In the start of 1984, the Memphis crowds went up with Savage and that angle, and everybody was making more money on the cards because there were fewer guys. Jarrett 
had a bit more control over the book to get the stip sheared, stip sheared, ship steered back in the right direction. And then Watts did what he did. When was the first time you heard any fear from any one of the crowds not coming back? Where? In which territory? In Memphis. Never. Because... It was always we could reheat this thing up. Well, I mean, in the 90s, yes. In the 90s, when I went back and made the shots with the Fabs, you know, or then later on, when we were working with them with Smoky Mountain, then that was a question, is it ever going to come back? And the answer was, it kind of really didn't. But no, in... Think about this. Memphis, Tennessee, since it had been absorbed by Nick Goulas and Roy Welch in 1957 into their territory, had been the town. It took a little while. I mean, Sputnik kicked it off, and then they went through a little bit of a malaise. But then the Blue Infernos and the Fargos, and then Jarrett took the book over, and then they moved to the Coliseum. There had never been a period of time since the late 1950s where the wrestling business in Memphis wasn't mostly healthy and the ratings on TV were through the roof. It just, it never got bad and then got good again. It just kept getting better. And in the early eighties, there was no reason to think that anything was going to go wrong, which it didn't for a few more years. But then it, it had to do with Vince's expansion and the changes in the business rather than, anything to do with the actual product itself in Memphis. The product was pretty much still good until it couldn't be good anymore because guy Vince was snatching up the talent and things were constricting. But and then here's the thing. Let's talk about the Memphis economics for a second because a lot of people are going, well, you know, he talks about Memphis, but what about Louisville or Lexington or Nashville or Evansville, Indiana? The other towns were always good, but Memphis, as, as Christine Jarrett used to call it, was the magic town. That was, for Goulas and Welch, Nashville was never the main town. In the 40s it was, because that was the town they had. But Nashville never had a major building that could hold huge crowds. They did regular business for a long period of time. The Hippodrome... Who knows, could you get 2,500 to 4,000 people in there are estimates of ranges. It was a roller rink with bleachers. There was huge standing room. You could make it fit. Nobody knows how many people were in that fucking thing. But over 4,000 was a stretch in Nashville. And that was the same going through the 70s with the old fairgrounds building and then the new fairgrounds building topped out at a little over 2,000. But to play, unless they would go downtown to the auditorium in Nashville or back in the 50s go outdoors, they could draw 3,000 people every week, but it, there weren't big events. Chattanooga and Birmingham were Goulas and Welch's big towns in the 50s and early 60s, but then Memphis eclipsed it. And so now, as we would be in 1983, not only did Memphis do pretty much always a minimum of $20,000 at the gate every week, and that would be $60,000 today. But the ones where it didn't like at the end of the year, bad weather only did 3,000 people. Well, they also did sellouts that year where one house was $46,000, one was $32,000, one was some. So you were talking about easily grossing in 1983, especially that's when they moved up from Tickets being five, four, and three to six, five, and four. So your average ticket in the Mid South Coliseum in most of 1983 was just a skosh under $5. So if you did 11,000 people, you did 45, 46,000 bucks. And that would triple to whatever that is three times in today's money. So you've got a million dollar town. You know when you Memphis is the big town in your territory. It's not the only one, but you know that you're going to gross somewhere around or north of a million dollars at the gate 
in that one town that year. That would be three million this year. Then you know that Channel 5 in Memphis, because of the ridiculous ratings, paid the company $1,500 a week to be allowed to air the television program. So that $75,000 becomes $225,000 in today's money that they were getting from a local television station for the right to air the program. To the best and of your knowledge, how many stations actually paid the wrestling show in 1982-83? <sighs> other than Memphis. There, I don't want to say none, because I'm going to say if we, if we looked and narrowed it down, there was probably a couple of individual deals in different places, but it was not widespread or even common or even... It was a, a sweet fucking deal. It's what it was. Because, but because of the ratings because they couldn't put anything on their television show, even network programs that drew that many viewers. The advertising was sold out. People were writing in for tickets six months in advance. And they had a sweetheart deal at the Coliseum because in 1977, the Coliseum released the figures to the newspaper that their deal at that point, now this is an 11,000 seat building. This was before the pyramid. This was the building in town. But because wrestling had been such an integral part of the Coliseum, Lawler's mother worked as the ticket seller. Guy Coffey had been the manager of the Ellis Auditorium and kibitzed at the Coliseum. They had a good relationship with the manager. And they were tenants 52 times a year meaning everybody that worked at the Coliseum got a, a payoff through the wrestling every week. They rented that building for $1,000 flat or 12.5% of the gate. So what's 12.5% of $20,000? 10% is 2 grand. So they were, they were renting an 11,000-seat building for a little over $2,000. And they're grossing 40-something thousand dollars. And the talent maybe is getting 30% of that, maybe. So it was a goddamn license to print money. They gross over a million dollars at the gate, three million in today's money. They get two hundred and almost fifty thousand dollars a year in today's money as rights fee. And Channel 5 made the copies of the show for Louisville and Evansville and Lexington and all that other stuff. They got their production for free. They had a quality professional television program that not only they didn't spend any money on, but the television station paid them to shoot it. And they aired it in all their other towns. That's why Memphis was so important to that promotion. So that's what they had to do on occasion is they would re-rack things. If, if Lawler was being a little extravagant with the roster, they'd trim that down. Jarrett would come in, he'd trim it down. He'd make sure that things were on an even keel. He'd see that there was some progress, and he'd go away and do whatever the fuck else he was doing until something required his attention again. And every, every so often, you'd re-rack. Business ain't good. We're going to change shit. And they'd turn it on a dime. And a guy in a fucking opening match last week might be in a fucking main event. And it might work. That's the way that happened. When was Questions. The was there at any point here that you were personally worried about your job? From the time I started. <laughs> no, but, but specifically, like, it feels like there's some change happening. You can feel the winds of change. Yes. Well, no, see, when we came back from Georgia, and we talked about that with the deep dive on the Georgia summer of 83 debacle. But then I was going, and we talked about it in the September uh, deep dive we did. I'm on the B team. There's so many guys in the territory that they're running two towns every night, and I'm in, you know, fucking Osceola, Arkansas, instead of Louisville or whatever. And a lot of the other guys were too, and they were starving, but they didn't have any fucking place to go lined up. And the buttermilk run, as Dream Machine called it, and at that point, I'm like, I realized, well, here's the thing. I didn't think they would just say, you're fired, you're done, don't do this anymore. Because then Teeny would have been mad, bless her. 
And they had asked me, they kind of invited me. And I don't think any, nobody would really wanted to fire me, but I was 50 bucks a night. So they were like, well, we'll put him in the spot shows. 50 bucks a night is all they had to pay me. If it drew more, they would. But we'll put him in the spot shows. We'll leave him off. We've only got one show. And maybe he'll quit on his own. And maybe he'll go back to taking pictures. We were making more money that way. But I wasn't going to quit. But at the same time, I realized, I'm like, I'm, I went to Lawler one time. I said, I feel absolutely useless. And he laughed. He, well, you know, we got to, you know, we'll rotate things around. And I asked him, I said, should I try to go somewhere? And he was like, well, if you, if you want to go ahead, you know, it's like, please let me help you pack your bag. But he wouldn't. So, and I talked to Ken Wayne because he had, was trying to get out and he had talked to Buck Robley in Kansas city. And that's, I've told you when Buck said, can he work? And Ken said, well, he can have manager matches. And Buck said, well, I can't pay anybody out here unless they can wrestle too, because he was making 300 bucks a week booking and wrestling. Buck. So thankfully, I didn't go there. And three or four weeks later, there came Watts. And looking back on it in hindsight, as we've said, that's now why I realized Jerry Jarrett was there. Oversee, even though Lawler was the booker, Jerry came back in, oversaw all the finishes, gave everybody all the finishes, told them how to structure the match. Going back to like we used to, as he said, a long set of heat with a lot of hope spots, get the people hooked and involved. He was showcasing all of the guys he wanted to get rid of, plus he also wanted Watts to think that he paid attention to his business instead of just letting Lawler say, yeah, go eight minutes and do whatever you want to do. So. Jarrett was there to implement that. And again, you know, within a couple weeks, then everything changed. And then I never, I never actually inquired to Buck. I asked uh, to Buck Robley, I asked Ken if he thought I should. And then after that didn't become necessary, then I began my string that continues to this day. I've never since asked to be booked anywhere by anybody or for a job from anyone in the wrestling business. They've always been offered. But yes, at one point I was like, well, sooner or later, they ain't going to let me do this anymore like this because this is the, just not important. Was there any grumbling from any of the veterans once you got back from Chattanooga or any of the other people there? I mean, were people already whispering like they're going to have to let some of us go at some point? Well, again, everybody kind of knew Lawler wouldn't really fire you. He'd just starve you out. Uh, but a lot of the guy, you know, poor Frank Morell. I mean, he had a house in Nashville. A lot of these guys had been around the territory, around that part of the country for a while, and things were just closing up where they couldn't go out and make a three-month run somewhere and come back and stay in their house. It was, and then, you know, it wasn't going to get any easier because 1984 was around the corner. So a lot of the guys, yeah, would love to have gone somewhere, but they didn't particularly have a place to go. But nobody was grumbling that, well, they ought to fucking fire those guys over there because everybody was kind of in the same boat. And it wasn't their fault that they were on the fucking card. The talent trade didn't just happen like that. It was kind of like a wave and then certain guys flowed in and out for a little bit. You know, Rick Rude was still there for a couple months after you got there, for instance. Rick, well, R Rick Rude was actually, Rick Rude and Mike Jackson were the first tag team to ever face Dennis Condry and Bobby Eaton the Midnight Express. On Mid-South TV, and, yeah. And, and I believe we beat Rude just to show you where everybody was at at that point, because Mike Jackson was the veteran. And Rude was really skinny and he was wearing trunks, not pants, so you could see just how skinny he was. But do you think Jerry Jarrett was doing it more just to not get rid of, but to move this talent out? Do you think he really thought, okay, I could make something out of Rick Rude and Jim Neidhart and various other people? Was it just to have guys on the roster? Or did he know I could take anyone and just... And no, he saw, he knew that he could, he needed different faces. He got rid of some. He probably didn't get the quality of work from the people that he got than the people he got rid of, but they were new faces. And he could, Neidhart, 
you know, was it was a guy you could do something with at that point because what a year later he's in the WWF, his Heart Foundation. Rick Rude had a lot of potential. You could see that you could develop him as a guy that might draw money against Lawler in Memphis. Masao Ito. I don't know what, unless Jerry was just fantasizing about the glory days of Tojo, I don't know what he was thinking there. And Hacksaw Higgins, he just wanted a big guy. But also, those guys, Jared could bring them in, he could pay them 50 bucks a night, he could give them their notice in two weeks, he had no commitment whatsoever, let's try it and see if it works. He, he didn't marry him, he just borrowed him for a while. And, you know, no, and, one, no one ever looks at it from this angle, but it was the best thing that could have happened to Rick Rude. Yeah. Because he wouldn't have turned into ravishing Rick Rude, probably, if this chain of events hadn't happened. He would have still been working for Bill Watts, and who knows where he would have been sent, and who knows if someone would have said, let me turn this guy heel. Because he was awkward, and he was green, and he was inexperienced, but that was what Lawler specialized in. Give me a guy that looks good, and I can have a match with him no matter what. And if it don't work, we cut it off and we change direction on a dime. And that's that's why I've, I've used Rick Rude as an example so many times. He was so green. Yes, Bill Watts loved real athletes and tough guys and probably would have taken an interest in Rick Rude. But he wasn't going to move up on the cards there because he was so green. And he'd had no experience and there was better talent. But when he went to Memphis... He's got the body. He's got the girlfriend valet. Lawler can cut some promos on him. Let's teach him a few things. Give him a fucking gimmick. Anybody got a robe? Here we go. And that's where you got a chance to try that shit. And then Rick Rude, R-O-O-D, became Rick Rude, R-U-D-E. And then he became ravishing. And then he had a girl. And then he learned how to swivel his hips. And then the goddamn fire department is bombing me right now. If you hear those, are these going to be the sirens that you can't hear? Well, I heard them. I was all right. And, but and, and in a smaller territory like that, that's where a guy gets a break. And if he's any good at all at this, then maybe the next tour territory will take him, which they did. Was the next place? Did he go to Florida? Work with Percy Pringle as Rick Rude from then on. After that, I think. And that was another place. He went place to Florida, to and then he went to Texas. Yeah, but I'm saying he went to Florida after after Memphis, but he already had the gimmick. Now he wasn't a job guy coming in, right? You know, with a brand new name and everything. Now he'd kind of worked on it a little bit. Then he went to Texas, and by then he was the fucking champion, world class champion. Two years later, right? And then he went from there to the NWA, where he gets a nice push as tag team with Manny Fernandez. They get the world yep. tag titles and. They take the belts, <laughs> literally <laughs> take the belts with them. My goddamn Mokovich belts. And then he's in the WWF four years later. But it was like four years of college for Rick Rude. And it started with Jerry Jarrett saying, like the way he looks, let's give him a gimmick. Well, that's the other thing. If you look at just Rick Rude's first four years, and it's not exclusive to him, it's most people from that era, I would think. But just looking at where he worked and when he worked there, in four years... Did he work a thousand matches? I mean, how he worked a lot in oh, four yeah. years. How many matches does a guy work nowadays if he starts in his first four years? Yeah, no, a, a thousand matches in four years at that point would have been, he would have had to be injured for long periods of time to not have had any more matches than that. That'd only be 250 a year. That would be way low. But anyway, that's the, that's the economics of a territory like that. And the promoters didn't go to try to sell out the biggest building in town for the biggest show ever and then start over from scratch again. They built it to where they did steady business for years and years and years. And the Tennessee Territory was an example of that in that wrestling never died in Nashville. It was more popular at some times and less popular at other times. At one point in the 60s, Nick was running twice a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays, because he didn't have a big enough building, so he just ran more shows. And Chattanooga, for 30 years, was, was regular. Birmingham was, as I said, the big town 50s and 60s, petered out because it ended up running on the same nights as, as Memphis, Monday nights, and Nick's end didn't do as good as Jarrett's did 
after he took over. But it was all about small cards, personal issues, main events that drew, everybody being figured in in some degree so that they could be moved in different places up and down on the cards, and repetition every week. Get those 3,000 people to buy a ticket for $5, and at the end of the year, you've sold 150 or 200,000 and you've grossed a half million dollars in some of the B-towns. The financial realities probably answer the question for me, but in the spring of 85, when Jimmy Hart leaves for the WWF, yes, and you're in Dallas, not very happy, and you're looking to go to World Cl- uh, you're looking to go to Mid-Atlantic, I should say, or Crockett, for, again, financial conditions, good money. <laughs> Any thought at all about calling up and saying, hey, I know Jimmy Hart's gone, but... I can come home. I hate Dallas. Well, no, I, I didn't hate Dallas. Was it, We had fun at various points, especially working with the Fantastics, and it was $1,000 a week, which would be three grand now, so that was like paid vacation money. Uh, we weren't being used properly, but there was never the thought of that because since we had been going to, we had already been asked by Dusty and Flair and already made a deal with Crockett, and then changed that to go to Dallas because Watts wanted us to. We already knew as soon as we left Dallas, whenever that was, we were going, because they'd said it's a standing offer. When you get finished out there, give us a call. So it wasn't like we were wondering where we were going to go from there. We were like, how long are we going to be here in Dallas before we go to work for Jimmy Crockett? So no, I never, you know, I was keeping up with videotapes and the happenings in the territories, but. I looked at it as more like, oh, Jimmy's gone to New York. It won't be the same in Memphis. But I wasn't like, I need to go back and replace him because I would have shot myself in the fucking foot. I may have been a better manager then in 85 than when I left in 83. But I wouldn't have been making nearly as much money as I would have been making in Memphis plus, or in uh, the Carolinas. Plus the boys would have said, what are you, crazy? Jimmy Crockett wants to make us the world tag team champions. You want to go back to Memphis? So no. I say no. All right, you say no, and this is your show, and that was a fascinating look at October 1983. Well, no, let's look at October now, my October, real quickly, because there's still, there's a couple of things in here that you can learn about the wrestling business, what I'm going to say. Again, in on October 1st, 1983, we're six weeks from Bill Watts coming to Memphis and look at the talent and me finding out that I'm going to get a new job. And I am the, the cohort of Jimmy Hart in the first family. Lawler's just decided every heel is managed by Jimmy Hart. They're all in the first family, but Hart can't be in two towns at the same time. So Jimmy Cornette is going to be his assistant first family manager and i'm gonna go to all the fucking tank towns and and uh do that jimmy hart will manage all the other heels including the other heel manager yes i was in the group of the other heel manager but we were all part of the first family and and that's like i said dundee had used just to be different he knew lawler was going to be the one to finally beat jimmy hart up but he could be the one to beat me up and so anyway But on October 1st, I was in Ripley, Tennessee, which was 350 miles round trip from Nashville. I spent $27 on gas and $4 on food because you know what the price of a Wendy's triple combo was in October 1983? No, how much? $4. (laughs) Really? In 1983? Yes, it was. Wow. And uh, it may have been some sense involved in that. But again, it's a spot show because they're running two towns almost every night because of all the people. They can't put 40 guys on a card in Louisville, right? Jarrett would have had a conniption fit. So I managed the Russian invader who was Jerry Novak, formerly of the Bounty Hunters. I believe I mentioned he was from Lithuania or wherever. He could speak Russian, but he wasn't Russian. But under the mask, he was Russian. And he beat the Jaguar, who was Danny Davis. And then I managed the Prince of Darkness and Lucifer, who were Duke Myers and Frank Morrell under Lawler's horror movie mass against the Rock and Roll Express, who won. 
Then me and Jimmy Hart, because Ripley was close to Memphis for the Saturday night, me and Jimmy Hart uh, got beat by Terry Taylor in a handicap match, and then I was eliminated in the Battle Royal. So it was a light night. I only worked four matches and got $100. And we, we started this discussion when we talked about September, but to me, this was... <laughs> It was excruciating at the time because I'm like, oh shit, I got to rush and go out there and I've come back and I'm blowed up and I got to go out again. And the boys love to fuck with me. They saw me looking like I had a bucket of water turned over my head. Hurry, Jim, hurry, they're about to ring the bell. But they, I realize now it was so much practice. It was so much experience. And not only that, but if I was fucking up they would I don't care if I was cheap or not, they wouldn't have had me going out seven times a night, right? If I was fucking anything up. And I can look back at that now having run shows and been responsible for, yeah, I like his shit. Send him out there, have him do some more shit. It was easier for the guys because we're on these small shows, small crowds for the most part. They don't want to work hard and take bumps. But now it's not like, it's not like having Jim Cornette at that point in time for a manager meant they got extra heat because I was a big managing star. It wasn't like, oh, this is going to make it if Cornette goes out with me. It was like, if I've got this fucking guy, this manager, he's on TV, they know who he is, he's annoying, but he knows if I'm a pretty boy heel, Cornette knows how to help me fold my robe and brush my hair and milk the people how good looking I am. If I'm a monster heel, Cornette knows I need to be held back and put over and made afraid, you know, people afraid of me. The baby face knew that I knew all the spots that were going to come up. That if I see Bill Dundee grab a headlock and get shot off near my ropes and he hits the far ropes and there's another drop down, he's going to dive out and chase me. When he does, I'm already halfway around the ring post so I can roll in, have a double knockout with the goddamn heel. I knew the spots. I knew wrestling. I could hand the gimmicks in. I could use it, whether it was a real foreign object that the heel was milking to get heat or whether it was a donut hole that didn't even exist. I could do that. I knew if the heel rolled out and hugged me in a conference that the baby face was going to reach out and run our heads together and all the kids in the crowd were going to fucking cheer. I, I could take the bumps and leave myself open to shit. So that's why the guys wanted me to go out on these small shows. If I'm out there being made a fool of, the heel manager, they got to take fewer bumps. So they learned that I learned to work all the spots with all these guys to stretch and stall for time and reduce the punishment on everybody's body, except for mine. But it was experience. So then Sunday, October 2nd, was a day off, because most of the time we were off on Sunday, unless we were in Jackson, Tennessee, which I was not. On Monday, October 3rd, I will have you know that while most of the people were down in Memphis, Tennessee, enjoying the big show of the week, I was in Mount Washington, Kentucky, which is literally down the road from Louisville, but I lived in Nashville on a $1,700 house, and I got paid 50 bucks. Now, bear in mind, I got 100 for Ripley, because that was a halfway decent house. But $1,700, even tripled, that meant it was a $5,100 house. In today's money, $50. For that... I managed Alpha the Galaxian in a losing effort against Tom Pritchard. I managed Carl Fergie in a losing effort against Tommy Rogers. I managed Lucifer and the Prince of Darkness in a losing effort against Bobby Fulton and Terry Taylor. I managed uh, Buddy Landell in a losing effort over Bill Dundee. And I got eliminated in the Battle Royal. Five matches that night. The next night in Waynesboro, Tennessee, in front of a $2,200 house, I got another 50 bucks. Same thing. Rock and Roll beat the Prince of Darkness and Lucifer. Dundee beat the Russian. Dutch Mantel and Coco beat the Bruise Brothers. And then Dundee came back and worked twice and beat Buddy Landell. 
and I got eliminated in a battle royal. The figures you're using, what are the sources of, uh, what's the source of these financial figures? And were you already asking these questions back then or writing them down? Yes, because that was the big question. I've said this before, the guys, whenever you work to show, you when you came in, what's the you asked the promoter, whoever the local promoter was, whoever was checking up at the box office, whoever was responsible. What's the advance look like? And either, oh, it's good, or oh, it's up from last time, or oh, it's not too good, or oh, it's, frankly, it's the shits, Jim. Or whatever you got. <laughs> but then at the end of the night, and this was something that I saw the top guys doing, and I picked up on it. Only I carried it as I usually do to the extremes. You know, when guys were on a big house in Memphis or Louisville did like 5,000 people, hey, what was the house? 27 grand or whatever. Oh, great. Well, I started asking. And to be honest, even Buddy Wayne, who a lot of these $2,200 houses were Buddy Wayne towns, or Eddie Marlin or whoever the promoter was, I asked Teeny in Louisville and Evansville. And we'd ask guys, coffee in memphis because he was the one checking up but i started recording good bad and indifferent because i wanted to know i want to know what the house was and what i got paid and the next time we ever came back there is it up or down and what was different so i started recording these things and honestly in some cases uh, some of these spot shows whoever was running them didn't really want to admit it but i think they admired my fucking interest in in the business end of the business and so they were legitimate figures. You didn't. You never asked how many people were here. You asked, wh what was the house? That's how you got paid. What was the money? If five people bought five $500 tickets, that was the same thing as 500 people buying five $505 tickets. It didn't matter. But anyway, on October 5th, I was supposed to be in Forest City, Arkansas. But I was off because I couldn't afford to make the fucking drive by myself and everybody else was down there. And I was off on Thursday the 6th as well. But back in action on Friday, October 7th in Blytheville, Arkansas at the American Legion Arena where the house was $2,400 and I got another 50 bucks. Coco Ware beat me and Jimmy Hart. The Fabs beat the Assassins and I got eliminated in a battle royal. And then, of course, we went to Memphis uh, that night because the, the town the next night was right outside of Memphis, but that's a, a week I wasn't even on television. They didn't have me go to TV. I just went to my cousin Larry's and slept late. But on the 8th Saturday night, I was in Obion, Tennessee for an $1,800 house for another $50. Listen to this one. The Russian invader got to beat Terry Taylor, by God. And then the Rock and Roll Express beat me and Lucifer because Duke was hurt. So they had me wrestle as Frank Morell's tag team partner. So I can say that I've been tombstoned by The Undertaker, figure forward by Ric Flair, pile driven by Jerry Lawler, and was Frank Morell's tag team partner. And then Dennis Condry and Norvell Austin beat Coco Ware and Dutch Mantell. Dundee beat Buddy Landell by DQ, and I got eliminated in a battle royal. Now, that week, I made $200 for working one, two, three, four days, and that would be $600 today, and it'd still be the shits, wouldn't it? Yeah. I never even heard of that town before. Obion, Tennessee? Obion, where's that? It's down the road from Webb City. You know where that is, don't you? No way. Halfway up a spider's ass. So uh, Sunday, October 9th, I was off. Now, the following week, things were looking up. Listen to this. On Monday, wait a minute. Let me just hold on here. On October 10th, 1983, on a Monday night, were, was Memphis running? Of course it was. Memphis had Austin Idol versus Stan Hansen in a bunkhouse match. Jerry Lawler versus Jesse Ventura for the Southern title. The Bruise Brothers versus the Rock and Roll Express. Buddy Landell versus Dutch Mantell, Tommy Rogers versus Coco Ware, and more. I was in Scottsville, Kentucky, 
$1,800 house. The payoff was $55. They took pity. Bobby Eaton beat Carl Fergie. And then Terry Taylor and Bobby Fulton beat Carl Fergie and Lucifer. The, they sent the Fabs to Scottsville. This may have been the start of some issues with the Fabs and Lawler. Fabs over the Assassins, Dundee over Landell, and me eliminated in a battle royal. And then since I was in Kentucky, I actually got to go to Louisville the next night. And that Louisville had an $8,900 house. So <laughs> all summer, Louisville had been fucking cooking. And now just like Memphis, it's starting to droop because it'd been hot-shotted and hot-shotted. So I get to go back to Louisville. The house isn't $9,000. At the ticket prices of that time period, that meant there was right around 2,000 people there, which was abysmal at that point in time. But I got $90. Dennis Condry and Norvell Austin had a no contest with the Rock and Roll Express. Shades of things to possibly come. Dundee beat me and Jimmy Hart in a handicap match, and the Fabulous Ones beat the Assassins. I splurged that day. I spent $7 on food. No hotel because I was home. What'd you buy? What was the food? Uh, well, I can't remember. I didn't write specifically. How would what I know that you wouldn't have that? Was. Seems like the kind of thing you'd keep track of. Probably went to Kingfish. Anyway, on in, on October twelfth, we went to Evansville, Indiana. The house was not recorded. I I got fifty dollars. I have a feeling it was one of those nights. I didn't want to disturb Christine. Terry Taylor was injured, so me and Jimmy Hart won our handicap match by default because they said, fuck it, this house, we're not even going to do that match. Dundee beat Jesse Ventura by disqualification. That's where I'm, That's the first time I managed Jesse Ventura because Hart was down at the other end. No, Hart was on the card. Then why didn't he go out with Jesse? I bet, you know what? It's a great story. Yeah, a great story, lady. <laughs> I managed Jesse Ventura. I know that much because I wrote it down. Jimmy Hart, I bet, was doing a deal with Lawler. And since we didn't have the handicap match, he saved him for that. And the Fabs beat the Assassins. And then we were in Bardstown, Kentucky on October 13th. $4,100 house. I got $65. Again, the Russian Invader won. He beat Bobby Fulton. Buddy Landell beat Tom Pritchard by DQ. Coco Ware beat me and Jimmy Hart. Coco Ware and Dutch Mantell beat the Russian and Lucifer. And I got eliminated in the Battle Royal. But this is a, it's a great week because now I've already worked four times. I got two more coming up. Boonville, Mississippi on the 14th and Nashville on the 15th. Go ahead. Did you enjoy doing Battle Royals? Oh, fuck no. Because, again, I, I still didn't really know what I was doing to, to do anything in the ring. And it got crowded. And generally what I would do on these spot shows, and the boys liked it because they'd get a bigger pop at the end, I would come out for the Battle Royal and slide under the ring where the referee wouldn't see me. And then they'd start the match, and while the Battle Royal was going on, I would crawl to the west side, then to the east side, then the north side, and I would peek out from under the apron skirt and make sure everybody saw that I was there and looked like I was scared. And then all the people were screaming, he's under the ring, he's under, get that son of a bitch, he's under the ring. And the referee would be oblivious until the ring cleared out a little bit. And then when there was a baby face and a heel or a couple of baby face and a couple of heels, I'd come out get somebody from behind, the heels would take over, and then the baby faces would make their comeback and either eliminate me and then the real heels, the real wrestlers, or save me for last and dump me for the big pop because they finally got the fucking weasel that was trying to get out of this because he was scared. Nobody told us to do that. In those days, the on a spot show, the instruction was, Battle Royal, Brian goes over, give us 10 minutes. You just figured the shit out. So that's what we usually did. As long as we know who's going over, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, in Boonville, Mississippi, Jerry Lawler went over me and Jimmy Hart. 
the fabulous ones went over the assassins and I was out in the battle Royal and Lawler and Hart were in Boonville. Cause it's right down the road from fucking Memphis. But we had earlier in the year, I believe I've, I've mentioned it. We've done a $10,000 house in Boonville. This is not recorded, but it was a $65 payoff. So I'm pretty sure that it wasn't no 10 grand. And then I wasn't on Memphis TV again, but I was back in Nashville on Saturday night, $5,900 house, $70 payoff. Listen to this match. Dennis Condry, Norvell Austin, and Buddy Landell, no contest. Ricky and Robert Gibson and Ricky Morton. Oh, wow. The Gibson brothers and the Rock and Roll Express in the same match against Dennis Condry, Buddy Landell, and Norvell Austin. That one was fun. And then Dundee beat me in heart. That was when I go out there and start cutting a promo about how Jimmy Hart is injured and can't be there that night. And since it's a handicap match and I don't have a partner, well, Dundee, you're just out of luck. We're going to have to call this whole thing off. And then Dundee jerks me in over the top rope and starts beating the shit out of me saying, fuck you, we're calling it off. And while he's beating me up, Jimmy with a baseball cap and a jumpsuit and a whole tray of popcorn things comes out and is trying to sneak up behind Dundee. But as he rolls in the ring, he's still got the tray of popcorns. Dundee turns around and draws back and he throws the popcorn up in the fucking air and, and Dundee nails Jimmy and Jimmy takes the bump and the popcorn comes right down on his fucking face. It was hilarious. That was Nashville. And then I was off again. And then, believe it or not, October 17th, we talked about it before. I'm back in Memphis. Oh, and by the way, I made $395 that week for work in six days. So if you triple that, I actually made $1,200, and I only had to work about 24 matches to do it. Is your mom asking you at all when she talks to you about how you're doing financially, and you think she's worried at all about what your future will be? Hey, well, yeah, well, she was like, Jimmy, you're not in Louisville. Well, I had to be down in Obion, Tennessee, Mom. Yeah, no, not making a lot of money here. I'm sure she was worried, but at the same point, it, was, it wasn't It was like I was, if I had gone to Louisiana and called home and said I'm making 300 bucks a week, she'd have been like, get your ass back here. But it was like she knew where I was. I lived in Nashville, but I'm seeing her a couple times a month. And at least it was a, you know, a friendly atmosphere, but I'm, I, she probably had some second thoughts about how this was going to work out toward the fall of 83. Yes. But on the 17th, that was the night Bobby Eaton lost to me and Jimmy Hart, the money deal. The house was $29,000 and I made 200 bucks. And I'm thinking, wow, this is going to be a goddamn great week, right? And I was in Louisville the next night and got $100 for a handicap match with Bobby and managing the Gibson, Morton, Condry, and them six-man. There's another $100. I'm like, wow, this is great. And then I was supposed to be in Evansville and Columbia, Kentucky, and it scratched out off. I'm pretty sure that's when I got so bad fucking sick I couldn't make Evansville and Columbia because I couldn't breathe through five matches per night with goddamn bronchitis. So I picked up on Friday the 21st in Pickwick, Tennessee, where the house $2,650. I got 60 bucks. I only had to work twice, one handicap match. And then in Bowling Green, Kentucky on the 22nd, where the house was $3,800, I got 60. I only had to work three times. So Memphis saved me. I made 420 bucks that week, only working four times. And we're coming down to the nub of things. Monday the 24th was off, as was Sunday the 23rd. No way they're going to let me go to Memphis. I might make a payoff. I was in Stanford, Kentucky on the 25th for 125 bucks. I was in Nashville on a Wednesday night show, which never drew in those days. For $50. And by the way, listen to this one. Bobby Fulton in a draw with Alpha the Galaxian. Pritchard over Lucifer. Rogers over Fergie. 
the moon dogs over Bobby Eaton and the Jaguar and the fabs over the assassins. That was the entire, I was literally out there for the entire fucking card. And then in cave city, Kentucky, same thing, five matches for $50 the next night. Same thing, the 28th, five matches. No, one, two, three, only four matches in Springfield, Tennessee for $50. Then we left Springfield, and I remember this. I rode with Frank Morrell, and uh, God dang it, who else was with us? It, may, it was Jerry Novak. Because we had to be in Springfield, Tennessee, which is northwest of Nashville. And we left there at, God damn it, 1030 at night, let's say, and had to go 240 miles to Memphis for Memphis TV. Did that, which was for free, by the way, and then turned around and came all the way back to Nashville, where we were in Nashville on Saturday night. 30 miles away from the show in Springfield, we'd done Friday night. So we did a 400-something, 500-mile round trip to go do a free TV taping. And then in Nashville, Bobby Fulton beat Alpha. I managed Pork Chop Cash. He beat Brock Woods. Lucifer was defeated by Bobby Eaton. The Russian invader drew Dutch Mantel. The Bruise Brothers beat Charles Atlas and James Daniels. Charles Atlas. Exactly. A black guy came into the territory, called himself Charles Atlas, and they tried to tell people he was Tony's brother. Oh, God. see, I don't even remember that. Yeah, it didn't <laughs> last long. And Coco Ware over Tommy Rogers by DQ and Lawler and Dundee over the Moondogs. I'm one, two, three, four, five, six, seven matches in Nashville. And then I was off on the 30th, and I was back in Memphis on the 31st, that famous Halloween night where not only did the fucking card tank, it only did like 14 grand. I made $75, but I was in the opening eight-man tag. Bobby Eaton, the Jaguar, Bobby Fulton, and James Daniels beat me, Lucifer, the Russian, and Carl Fergie. And that was... I, <laughs> Again, I got to work with so many different guys. I managed Ken Patera. I managed Jesse Ventura. I was, you know, involved with all of these top guys. They were all giving me all of their various moves and shit. It was like going to wrestling school, I guess. But um, even 40 years ago, it was hard to live on $250 to $300 a week when you were going somewhere six days out of that week oftentimes and working 30 to 35 times for working that schedule and making that kind of money. Was it hard to convince, I guess Watts would have been one. Was it hard for Watts to convince Carl Fergie to get out of the ring the next year? <laughs> Carl Fergie would have kept that referee job in mid South until the end of his life. If he'd had a choice, because that's the thing. The first check we got from Bill Watts for doing preliminary matches on the cards when we first started in the territory was the biggest check I'd ever gotten in the wrestling business for being in prelims. The biggest payoff that I'd gotten to that point was $300 for being in the semifinal match of that Lawler Dundee loser leave town match in the summer. My biggest week had been, I think $800. Now, of course, $2,400 in today's money, not bad for a rookie. But that then suddenly, you know, the, for our first check for Watts is almost $1,100 for prelim matches. And then the following two weeks, uh, we didn't, by payoffs, we didn't make $1,000. But Watts had promised us, assured us that we would make at least $1,000 a week so he bonused us so we would. And, you know, it, it was with, a $200 bonus. I like your haircut. I mean, what kind of bonus was it? Well, that, that's the thing. It was, it, 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 Watts would bonus guys probably what they should have been paid to begin with, but because it was clearly defined as here's your payoff and here's a bonus, you felt good about it. But if you had a good match, you saw on your check, plus whatever. Or if you 
did something to distinguish yourself. You, you know, got there despite all obstacles of you making the town or, you know, you made the finish even better or it was something he wanted to show on TV and it was so good. Whatever in his mind you deserved a little plus, he would plus you. Or just if he was making up a verbal agreement. It's the only, uh, Crockett just gave us payoffs, good payoffs, but he never bonused us or plussed us. Watts would plus you because it was an incentive. You want to see a lot of pluses. Did you get a bonus, a plus when you lost your hair? I did not. So there, because was, it, there was no incentive. It didn't, it didn't <laughs> fucking draw as well as they thought it would, so he didn't feel bonusy. But but I did get you know I got I got a bonus as I recall when I goddamn came back early from goddamn mono so I could make the show you know whatever but but that's it you talked about Fergie the referee checks when we were hot in mid south were the equivalent to what the top heel in Memphis was making wow really the opening match guys. In and because we talked to him, because we knew some of Jerry Gray, Pat Rose, the guys in the opening match in Mid South when we were doing that business were making eight hundred to a thousand dollars a week, and that would be what twenty five hundred, three thousand dollars in today's money to jerk the curtain. So, yeah, no, you would. It, Carl Fergie was happier being a referee, and making a thousand dollars than being a wrestler in Tennessee, making 400 with where the spot he'd have been on the card. All right. Well, there you go. But I mean, that that's a thing. And again, you know, that was a, like the opening match guys making a thousand dollars a week, but that was for a three month run and it wasn't every week. And it was, you know, but, but that was better than they were going to do in other places. And that's why you wanted to be on the card in a hot territory. And Watts was very fiscally conservative too. You know, he built the package shows like Eddie Graham did seven big matches, 18 stars, two titles on the line. That was, that's what I'm saying. 18 guys on a card, seven big matches, two championships at stake, you know, prices raised for this major event. He wouldn't have 40 guys on a fucking card in a Superdome. Because at, at some point, if you've got 40 guys on your card, regardless of who they are, good, bad, or indifferent, only 10 or 12 of them were in whatever matches that drew the money. And then you're just paying guys to, you know, indulge their goddamn, you know, enjoyment of being on your card because they didn't contribute anything not because they didn't work hard or they're not a name, but because they're not at a feature match. You can't be that deep with a wrestling card and everybody means something. So, and, and then Watts had the thing in 84 that they were never able to do in the Tennessee territory of raising prices indiscriminately depending on the size of the card and the attraction at the top. And I mean, we were in towns in just one year in Louisiana that it had four or five sets of ticket prices. The last stampede, he jacked everything. A place that had $8 ringside for a regular show would be $15 ringside. But they were paying it. So he did all kinds of unusual things that he could get by with in that territory, and he really, because of the geographic area and the fact that he had cobbled it together from the Louisiana Territory, McGurk's Oklahoma Territory, Paul Bosch's Houston. You could do different things in different towns. You could jack the prices up in the Sam Houston Coliseum for the last stampede or scaffold match or Ric Flair and Kerry or whatever. And it's Houston, Texas. They'll pay it. But you got to run the same fucking attractions in Jackson, Mississippi for half the price, $8, maybe $10 ringside because it's fucking Mississippi. But he was able to do that all over the place and gross well over a million dollars just in a five or six week period in that territory because he played with the ticket prices and he was also fiscally conservative with the number of guys that were on the card. So everybody could make a decent payoff. Because they're splitting 
the same amount of money up between 20 guys as 40 guys. It's not like the promoter saying, I got 40 guys. I got to pay them a bunch more money. Stars get the same thing and everybody else gets half as much. Another case of there you go. Well, the listeners have gotten the opposite of half as much this week here on the show. They've gotten twice as much. Good. We don't have to do this in a couple of days when it's your program then, do they? Do we? I mean, a couple of days. A couple of days tomorrow. When do we do start oh, next hour and an hour from now? When do we do the next program? I don't know. Can we play Guess the Sleep Chair? That's what I want to play right now. All righty. Well, in parting, we want to wish you love, peace, and soul. Hopefully everything is learned. Uh, everything is learned. Everything everybody, is learned. Hopefully everything is learned. Everybody has learned something <laughs> about the old days of wrestling and how the business worked. And we'll be back with your program that people will learn absolutely nothing from. Until then, thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, everybody.